Good morning, everybody, and um, good morning, every. Okay. So, kia ora, welcome, and good morning, everybody. Um, we're uh, on live stream, sitting um, at the Marae. Uh, in Otaki, and uh, we have been welcomed by uh, Tangata Whenua, so we thank them very much. Um, it's a beautiful space, probably the best space I've ever sat as a hearing, <laughs> and um, uh, our job is to continue the hearing on Plan Change 2. My name is John Marson, and I'm chairing with Jane Black and Raro Kirikiri. And um, we asked to be located in Ōtaki uh, in our first minute for two reasons. The first is that there was a submission from uh, Nahapu Ōtaki that expressed interest uh, in these proceedings uh, and emphasised the uh, special character of Ōtaki um, uh, as a place where Tangata Whenua have been here for a very long time and uh, I was personally aware of that um, having uh, holidayed here and lived here part-time for many years so uh, it's important uh, to create the environment in which we can understand their interests and concerns, um, and to celebrate the distinctive identity of Ōtaki. So we're very, very pleased that this occasion can be accommodated. And we're now hearing submissions. We will, uh, in terms of uh, some of the submissions we'll be hearing in this house, um, some of them actually do have a significant impact on the identity of Ōtaki Township. Um, you, uh, for example, have the council proposing a precinct B in this locality close to the marae, although the marae is protected by the Takiwa precinct. Um, but that enablement uh, of height and additional density is a significant transformation uh, for the township uh, uh, if it proceeds like it is for other communities. And it's particularly important to understand its impacts in terms of the relationship of Tangata Whenua with their ancestral lands. Um, and on the other hand, you have uh, Kainga Ora, who's proposed an even more intensification, and then Nahapu or Otaki, which is saying, hold on a minute, we feel that this isn't quite yet landed in a way that we um, fully appreciate or understand and helps to form our identity. So uh, these tensions are going to be explored over the next few days and we will listen attentively and try to understand all of those perspectives. So that's part of the business. So it's quite appropriate that we're here. Um, and we'll just commence um, if that's protocol to hear the first submission, and that's submission 85 uh, from the Friends of Lake Karupa, uh, which is Liz Francis and Neil Gordon. So welcome. If you'd like to come forward and just have a seat there. Is it ready? Okay. 
Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanakoto Katoa. Go to Francis Aho. Um, I daren't do any more. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to come and present here. Um, it's a great privilege, actually, coming on to an eye like this. <clears throat> I'm presenting on behalf of the Friends of Lake Karafa. Um, Neil Gordon was going to do the presentation, but he's unfortunately got a sick family member. Okay. Sorry, I've not got a very loud voice anyway, um, but I'll do my best. Um, first of all, I'll, I'll explain to you who the friends of Lake Karafa are. Um, we're a group, we're a neighborhood uh, on the northern side of Otaki here. We're called Friends of Lake Karafa because we had a discussion with council and they indicated that it would be a good idea if we actually uh, had an official name. And so we agreed that this is what we would call ourselves because at the time we chose the name, there was a whole lot of weed on the Lake Karafa and um, we were exploring the options of clearing it. Um, so we decided we were all friends of Lake Karafa. And we have a very active group which meets regularly in the neighborhood. Um, and we're involved, we're involved in um, looking after the, our environment. Um, the council work in with us and we work in with them. And also the regional council provided us with instruction on how to use rat traps. So we have a team that goes out trapping rats. And we've got a lot of bird life, which we all enjoy. Anyway, I'll get back to our submission. The points that I want to cover um, in the submission, I will just briefly refer to the ones we put in the submission. And then I want to talk a little bit about our community and environment. Um, so why we are here is because Tamihana Street, which is the closest street to the shopping area here in our settlement there, has been divided in half down the middle. And we didn't expect any uh, great density to occur in, in um, Otaki. It was quite a shock when I just accidentally uh, discovered it. Um, because I was curious about what was happening. And I asked my neighbours if they knew what was happening and none of them knew. So we got together and had a meeting. And as a result of that, because we had lots of questions, we asked if the council could come and clarify things for us. So Jason came and spoke to us um, and explained things to us one evening. Um, and so then we put forward our submission. So we actually want to challenge the boundary that has been set. Um, we don't see the logic. The council actually in their document says that it's a lot, the boundary is a logical one, but we actually see it as illogical. I'm very sorry, but it is illogical. So the boundary between, for the, for the stages of intensification runs middle of our street. So one side is allowed to um, build four stories high and the other side, three stories. I think that's an awfully big ask for a little country town to go from single story buildings to four story buildings. I know it's um, over a long period of time that it's expected to occur, but it's still a big ask. Um, we, Lake, um, Lake Karafar is actually a subdivision um, that when we bought into was advertised as having lots of green spaces. 
and admittedly some of our sections are rather large but then they're also rather awkwardly shaped um, a number of them run along the edge of the stream and there are quite considerable setbacks for the possibility of flooding occurring and at times the water has been quite high the little lake that we refer to and some people call it a pond um, floods and it acts as well it doesn't flood it acts as a storage um, for stormwater and is working very effectively uh, so we've although we've got walkways which are really nice to wander around on they also become submerged when there is a lot of water flowing in the streams um, anyway we signed a covenant when we bought the properties that that um uh, um, instructed us on the heights of fences. It actually encouraged us not to have fences, to have lots of open spaces. Um, it, it encouraged us to plant native plants, plantings, and most properties have done that. Um, and we feel very much a part of a special community. Um, I have a friend, Anne Thorpe, who some of you will know, who called it a unique community, and I think it is. Um, I've lived in lots of different places in New Zealand, and there have been places where I have not even known the names of my neighbours. But when I came here, one of my friends came and visited within a couple of weeks of my shifting in, and she said, do you know any of your neighbours? And I said, yes, and I rattled off the whole lot. Um, it's a very close community and it's a very supportive community um, and we feel very much although we don't live in each other's households we support each other we we share uh, crops we share seeds uh, we occasionally have barbecues and meals at other people's places we have annual events like at christmas time we've got the rat trapping and so forth so being told that you're suddenly uh, um, on, in a part that's going to be more intensively housed than the other, it just, it might sound totally unreasonable, but it actually hurts because it feels as though you've been divided off from the rest of the community. Now, one of the things that I, um, yeah. The, the second point I'd, I'd just like to talk to is that the um, parameters that KCDC set out was for the boundary to be 400 metres walk from town, um, and that's in Appendix E, and we had a map that we put in with our submission. I have got a copy here. The closest house on our estate to town is over 400 metres from town and the houses down my end of the street are actually closer to 900 metres from town. There's only the one access way, we can't cross the stream, so we actually fall outside the parameters that KCDC set for setting the boundary. Um, it's actually a kilometre from Joy's place to Countdown. Joy's the lady sitting over yonder, and she lives in the in the um, furthest end of Tamihana Street. So the third point I'd like to make is that there's a setback along the stream, Mangapuri Stream. So there's a very small area for building some of those houses along there. Um, the, if the if you have a look at the flooding maps, the the water would come up to the edge of the homes. So even although on the previous council maps, it's acknowledged that the whole area is low lying um, and has poor drainage, that's not actually been acknowledged. It's not actually included in the new plan. And suddenly you can't explain it away. Why, why is it suddenly um, drier than it was in the past? It isn't. It's, it can be a very wet area. Um, there's quite a lot of drainage because we're lower lying than Lupin Road. We go down quite a dip to get in there. 
Um, I'll leave you that out. So the other issue is that the boundary crosses the stream from the previous boundary that was set, which doesn't acknowledge the recommendation that natural boundaries um, be uh, serve as natural features serve as the boundary, such as rivers. And we see the natural feature being that stream. It goes around three sides of our estate. Um, now if I can make just a couple of comments about community and the environment. Uh, some of our concerns uh, really pertain to the whole of Otaki, not just our estate. We recognize that housing is an issue and that's the current emphasis obviously but the in the long term it's the social it's the community that is important it's the social and the environmental things that are important and as i've said this is a, a we live in a, a, a unique community in otaki um because of the strong Māori culture. And I just hope that it will be acknowledged in all that is um, planned. There's some beautiful buildings down the end of the road. I'd, I'd love to see them multiplied all around the place, to be quite honest. One of the issues that I have is that the Resource Management Act has shifted power away from residents. And this really is our only opportunity to stand up and say, we're concerned. We're concerned about what might suddenly appear over the other side of our hedge. We have no say um, so long as it meets the structural um, and other issues like that that the council have to have addressed. The neighbourhoods have lost the ability to say, whoa, that doesn't fit in with our community. Um, it disrupts social connections. It potentially disrupts our social connections. I know this might not be very popular, but down the side of the street where I am, there are a number of rental properties. And it's quite obvious as you walk down which they are, because none of them have gardens or trees. And unfortunately, although they've been invited, none of the residents, and they're nice people, none of the residents come and join in. And neither do the um, property owners join in. Um, they're not they're not so invested in the community as we are who live there long term. And if, if it went ahead, if this all goes ahead and there's an intensity of housing in the street, our street has been planned to quieten traffic. Um, there are a lot of little children that ride their bikes up and down the street. That would disappear. It would have to disappear if there are more cars are, are coming along the street they would probably have to straighten the street because it's intentionally curved to slow the traffic. And they'd probably have to remove the Pahutakawa trees that border the street in order to do that. We, we are concerned that some of this push for intensification, we're going to lose our green environment. Um, Simon Upton has put in a report to government which stresses that the green environment is important. It's important for well-being. Um, we read recently in newspapers and things about people, what do they call it, green bathing, bathing in the forest. Well, and they reckon that people are much better off emotionally if they're living in the, an environment with trees and plants. So the green environment is important. It's important to us in our state, but for the whole of Otaki as well. It's also important in terms of the climate. 
um, if you cover the masses of ground with concrete and houses and so forth, there's less ability for water to drain off. And you, you have problems with flooding as they've had in Auckland. So in conclusion, I'll just say that the template that, that's been used, when I read through various documents, they keep talking about cities. And I just feel that this is a template for a city, not a small town. And that we, while we need affordable housing and a town plan that is a really positive one, we need to ensure that our community, our existing communities, the small communities, that they are, they are enhanced and not diminished. So kia ora satu katoa. <clears throat> I mean, we live as like Karufa Estate, but and that I'm looking at the Google map here with that pond or lake that's Lake Karufa, right? How did it get its name? You've got me there. I know the story behind Tamihana Street because I've read up about that, but um, and I don't know. You might Anybody be able know? to enlighten me. Yeah, that that's it. I mean, that's what Karufa is. There's four eyes. But I just wondered whether, not only where the name came from, but whether there was a history to it as well. Oh yeah. Lake Karuba. Is it a man made lake, do you know? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tamihana named after Tamihana Te Rauparaha, and I think the Karufa is also because it's a man-made lake. A little bit of hydrology because before this, uh, the subdivision went in there, that entire paddock area would flood. Every winter it would flood, overflow into the Mangapodi stream, and then it would continue on for the other residential areas that border the Manga, Manga, uh, Mangapodi stream all the way up to, to Waitahu. To the Waitahu stream. So yes, the, um, a Karufa has, I think it's got a double edge. I think it's partly because it's a man-made lake, but I think it's also because of, you know, that Lupin Road goes right in, uh, joined straight into Hadfield Street. So of course, Octavius Hadfield was one of the first missioners, missionaries here. And uh, that area was all empty at the time. And his house is Austin Lock House, which was just on the corner of Hadfield Street and Taraupuraha Street. So in those days, it was just quite an open expanse area until it was purchased and farmed. Thank you. So just um, two things. Um, first of all, we went to the area in our site visit before some uh, last year, and it has a distinctive enclosed identity. So we agree with you there. And you've done well to work, follow through some of the rationale for this. The other point is that uh, Mr. Banks, who's the council's consultant planner, has provided us with a report that agrees with your view and has recommended to us that we adjust the boundary so that it excludes uh, the residents of Tamihana Street. So um, 
subject to anything else we have to hear, it looks like it's heading in the right direction for you. And so thank you very much for your time. All right, so the next person is Luke Richards. Kia ora. Great. Yep, thanks. Come forward. Welcome. Uh, my name is Phil Quarry. I'm a consulting surveyor and land development uh, professional with our business located at Palmerston North. I'm here to represent Luke Richards, who's actually my cousin, and his neighbour, Nancy Hung, who has the market gardening property next next door to um, Luke's property. Their submission seeks to have the zoning of their land from the present general rural zone within precinct 48, being the rural dunes precinct, to a residential zoning. The land is at the eastern edge of the Otaki or O2, O1 future residential area. And now that's shown in um, appendix N of the uh, documentation that's there. Um, it's the little area to the, I'll just grab a copy of it. It's, it's, it's a, the very western, eastern end of the western block of land that's proposing to eventually join Otaki with Otaki Beach. It's zoned, it's not zoned, it's identified as priority three for the extension of the residential zones. Yes. Um, for convenience and consistency, their submission is for the rezoning of the land from the western end of Luke Richards land at 15 Tirapaha Street to Bennett's Road and between Tirapaha Street uh, Convent Road and the Mangapuri Stream. It's that northwestern corner of the um, residential zone or adjoining the residential zone. Um, it's an area of approximately 13.7 hectares. The submitters own 80% of this land being approximately 10.8 hectares. The land at the north, it's the land at the northwest extent of the town's residential area. The other remaining bit of land is owned by three owners. Um, the consensus was that it's a bit 
silly to, to leave a little bit of a corner of a land out of that zoning. But there hasn't been any substantial consultation with those three other landowners. Uh, yes, by, by um, Luke and Nancy. The submitted lands, the submitted's land adjoins and is opposite residential land that has been extensively developed over the past 70 years and includes St. Peter Chanel Catholic School. Now, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. So, yeah. um, the land owned by Luke is the remnants of a larger property that has been progressively subdivided for residential use, with the remainder, remainder being left for farming use, which is no longer economic. Nancy's property has been used for market gardening for many years, but it has become increasingly difficult to continue this active activity commercially and economically. The land fronts a significant local road providing access to the residential and rural areas at the northwestern part of the town. Residential reticulated services exist along Tirapaha Street and Convent Road. Water supply services extend north along Convent Road and also service Bennett's Road. The public sewer terminates at the St. Peter Chanel Catholic School. In August 2020, I, on behalf of Luke, contact the council to discuss the viability of subdividing his land due to the impending cessation of the dairy farm lease and that further economic use was of the land was unlikely. The district plan rules at the time, both operative and proposed, effectively prevented any further subdivision of the land. By that I mean it's, it's a block of rural land, it's too small to go into further subdivision as a controlled or discretionary activity and either plan simply because it's not big enough to start with. But it's too it's too big to be used as anything but a large lifestyle block. Um, the district uh, sorry. The meetings were held at the council in October 2020 and in March 2021 to discuss options that were available. Two proposals were considered, being a 14 lot medium density lifestyle subdivision with lot sizes ranging from 4,000 to 5,000 square metres, and a nine lot low density subdivision with lot sizes of 6,000 up to 1.3 hectares. Both proposals involved creating a residential lot at the um, Tirapa House Street frontage, and that's where there's an old house at the moment beside a, a big Norfolk pine and a new public road. We determined that neither option was the best use of the land and that little could be achieved without a zoning change. It is considered that the best use of the land is for residential development. Now I've just read that to you to give you some background as to what's, what's been proposed and how it's been looked at. Upon notification of, the, of the, the plan change, a submission was made to include the land and that of the neighboring properties. Primarily the land owned by um, by uh, Nancy to be included within the extended residential loan uh, zone. So while a submission came from Luke, it's really a joint submission from Luke and Nancy. And like I say, for convenience and consistency, it's extended out to Bennett Road because that's a logical place to um, finish the zone boundary. It was surprised to the Smithers that their land was not included in the proposed extensions, given that there have been extensive discussions with council staff about the subdivision of the Richards property and the desire for it to be subdivided for residential use. It is considered that the subdivision for the rezoning is within the scope of this hearing, as it is within the land identified for future urban growth. The land adjoins and is opposite existing residential land the desire for the development of the of the area has been known by council. The land is able to be serviced from existing council reticulated services and the identified issues of overland flow can be mitigated and they are, not, they are not any different to those already affecting the adjoining residential areas. Um, if you have a look at the Wellington Regional flooding maps, it shows areas of uh, flooding and uh, overland flow, but all of them are 
minor. That they're, I think the deepest is about 300 mils or something. And for a major event, all of those can be mitigated. The Richards land is too small to be economically farmed and has been and has been previously used as part of the adjoining dairy farm. However, since the cessation of this business, it's only been used for low intensity grazing. Nancy's land has become too small to continue as an economic market garden. The costs incurred for business, the inability to obtain and retain staff, the extensive hours of works, works required, and the inability to sell the business due to these problems are now forcing the owners to consider abandoning the business. Attempts to sell the business and or purchase additional land have proved to be unviable. Unfortunately, it's a simple fact, and Nancy will talk further about it, it's just the lack of people wanting to do the hard yards, and some people say, well, the hard yards that had to be put in are just too hard, and nobody wants to do it. Um, the cost of machinery is a problem. Um, it's too small to be viable, and nobody else wants to take it on. And up in the manner or two, we've had major problems with um, market gardens that have actually been sold off to adjoining ones just to make them viable. Um, because there is the economics of it, you have to have a really big block and go into like a factory system. The days of small market gardening are fast disappearing. Uh, these problems will result in both properties being left in an abandoned state with little, if any, contribution to Otaki's economy. It is considered that the change in zoning will assist in the supply of residential properties for Otaki and the associated benefits that will occur, with little adverse effects upon the surrounding rural land. It envisages that a joint development will occur on the submitted properties that will ensure the most efficient use of the land. The rural land to the west is only able to be serviced from Tasman Road, the rural land to the north is separated from future development by the Mangapuri stream with all access from Bennett's Road. The three properties between Nancy's Land and Bennett's Road are able to be serviced from Convent and Bennett's Road, but would have little adverse effects due to the limitations of development at the northern end of the property, because you're starting to get down low beside the, the floodplain of the Mangapuri. The existing residential properties have an expectation that residential development will occur on the adjoining rural land as per the anticipated and notified expansion of Otaki towards Otaki Beach. In summary, it is considered that it is most appropriate that the identified area in the submission be rezoned for residential use, even to the extent if, it, if you consider that it's inappropriate to rezone it for the three owners up by Bennett Road to ensure that the opportunity for residential use is not lost. Now, the committee is probably not aware of the two proposals that were done for the property. The major problem, I as a, having done this job for 40 years, would see that it's a lost opportunity to do a lifestyle development, particularly in the area right beside the residential area of the town and the residential area of the town has to expand and while it's priority three in the the growth area once you do the residential development a uh, lifestyle development in a residential area it's virtually impossible to change that to residential land in the future um, i pride myself well if you've got a resident if you change a block of rural land to lifestyle within an area that's zoned residential, it is virtually impossible to convert that to residential in the future. I pride myself that I'm the only consultant that I know of in the Manawatu Horofanua area that has actually successfully been able to convert residential, well, convert lifestyle block land into residential land. An extremely difficult and frustrating process, and it only resulted because of the developer managed to buy out the neighboring owners. Um, you have houses in the wrong spot. You have boundaries which are completely wrong for residential development. So while it is a possibility, it's certainly not the preferred option. Um, 
the issue with flooding, as seen on the the maps, is a uh, I don't want to say minor one, but it, it's we don't consider it to be a significant issue. There's ways around it. Unfortunately, the recent events in Auckland and Hawke's Bay have brought it into light. But there's always a way to deal with that. And there's already identified flooding issues with a whole lot of development on the eastern side or land surrounding Tarapaha Street. So, and from what I've been told, and I have no history in the area, that it's not that significant. Um, it's more of a case that this might occur, but there is ways to amend things. Um, really, the the crux of the matter is, short of doing a private plan change, which is not economically feasible, um, we believe it's appropriate that this land be included in a zone change, or at the very least, another plan change be initiated by council to include the areas this area and the other areas where people have sought to have um, their land rezoned as residential, particularly that stuff which is zoned future residential. Um, if you'd like to ask me any questions or would you like me to pass on to Luke and Nancy to, to say some further information? Yeah. Well, I think, um, I'll ask Nancy first and then I'll ask So um, the area that's priority three looks like it's an appendix in, but there's quite a large area. Sorry, the, the area that you identify as priority three uh, for Ōtaki um, appears to be quite a large area extending from, uh, I think, uh, Te Rapaha Street through to the current built form of Ōtaki Beach. Is that correct? It basically links Ōtaki to Ōtaki Beach. Right. Um, and that represents, I guess, on the basis of this study, as an opportunity for a well-designed, uh, uh, well-structured development plan. Would you agree with that? It's, I see it as putting out there and notifying the general public as well as particular landowners that it's expected over the next few years that you will, we will see development linking the two towns together. Yeah. Um, and so you want to have a coordinated environment. I don't necessarily believe you need to have a structure plan, but you need to have a coordinated environment. But putting in what we've had no option to do, but a large lifestyle block yeah. is not appropriate. No. But is the land zoned for lifestyle? No, it's zoned for rural. Yeah. Um, and we will be having it as a, either uh, discretionary activity or a non-complying activity. Right. Ultimately, the best option is to go for a complete um, plan change. Mm. And um, in terms of um, land class, would I describe um, uh, just get this right. Um, Uh, Ms. Huang's um, land is class one. Are you class one? Well, I haven't checked it, but I suspect it's probably more class two. Right. With, with class uh, four on the dunes. There's, there's a big dune on the corner of of uh, Luke Richard's land. Yeah, no, I'm talking about uh, Ms. Huang's land. Uh, that looks to me like it's either class one or two. It would be class two. Yeah. So you have done, have you checked the LUC maps? No, I haven't had a chance to do that. So no. yeah. Do you know what your land use capability class is? <laughs> Good soil? Under the vegetable, a bigger, bigger loose uh, disease and all the weeds, some kind of weeds and the very hard to grow it. And oh, yeah. yeah, when the summer days, very hard to soil. Yeah. Oh yeah, so yeah. there's a bit of a wet limitation there. Um, 
Okay, so um, the the river behind that property, behind the Richards and Huang property, is um, a tributary of the Waitau. And, that's the Mangapari, and it feeds into the Waitahu. Feeds into the Waitahu. It leads the feeds into the what? Into the Waitahu. Waitahu. Yeah. Okay, and um, so Mr. Rich's land is also class two or class three? Parts of it are, would be class two and class three, and the dunes were probably sitting there in class six. Right, and is that, um, it, you're quite close to um, the Wānanga and Rangiatia church, which looks to me to be quite uh <coughs> ancestral land is do you know have you consulted with Tangata Fenua about the significance of those dunes? No, not at all. No. And what about um how 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 to manage the margin of the is it the mana mana manapodi? Mangapodi. Have you have you had a dis have you engaged with Tangata Fenua about the values that sit along that river? There's not been any specific engagement, but I would envisage that would end up having an Esplanade Reserve for at least 20 metres. Right. And there would be some stormwater retention, other developments, if we were looking at doing residential. Um, as, a, as a large lifestyle block, there's really no need for that because your density is way down. Um, looks to me like historically that's got a lot of cultural values because it's got uh, along that street Rangiatia Church, the Tikura Kaupapa, um, Ahini Marie or the um, St. Mary's Church, the Orapa. So it looks to me like it's an area that has quite a strong Tangata Whenua identity and areas, is that true? I can't answer that really. Can't tell you that. Hmm. Um, the reason we ask is that um, potentially if the council was wanting to look at developing that land as a total package, it would want to respond to those values if they existed. Um, and that would require some elements of design. And I'm just wondering whether um, through this process, much as I understand why you've engaged in it, um, uh, it needs actually a more concentrated assessment of those cultural values and, and other natural values. Those, one, those actions will be taken as part of the, if you're doing a, a residential subdivision, but this is on the basis that that land has already been identified as a future growth area. And the only reason it's sitting in there as priority three is because of some issues to do with flooding, as, as much as I've been able to determine. So one would have anticipated that there would have been some high level discussions dealing with the impacts of taking that land and converting it all to residential. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that at, at an opportunities constraints level, um broadly speaking it's an area of interest to be examined but i wouldn't go so far as to say it, it's gone to the level of of full interrogation no i don't believe it's gone to that to that depth but clearly there's been a tension which has been publicly announced for several years now that that's where the growth area or one of the growth areas be it at third order not um uh, priority at, at one or right two or two and is that third two. order functionally tied to population growth or demand or what is it tied to it appears to be tied to the ability to develop but i've never been involved in the reasoning for it you mean what is it what 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 controls the ability to develop well from what i understand looking at documents it's an issue about flooding right 
So there is there are there are hazards identified in that area. Yes, there are. That, that that's shown quite clearly on the regional council planning maps. Yeah, and so that whole area has a hazard flood hazard notation. It it has shown us as flood prone and overland flow. Right. But that extends further back to the east, right through the residential areas within that part of the, the town. But it includes the subject land. Yes, it does, yeah. Hmm. But mitigation measures are available, and we're only talking about a small depth of flooding there, not you know, metres of it. Or, you know, like, so I think the, the worst in a 200-year in a event is 300 mils. So right. it's, it's not significant. Um. All right, and um, I, th I think I think there's a little margin. Uh, um, I'm a little bit familiar with this piece of land because I uh, attend St Mary's Church when I'm in Otaki. <laughs> so um, there's a little stream that runs, um, also divides. The Huang land, it's about an area of maybe 300 square meters, and you can see it in this uh, in my Google Maps. It, do, it doesn't actually divide the, the Nancy's land because they own up to the left bank of the stream. Right. And there's a, there's a section of that stream which is effectively treated as road reserve between there and the boundary of the road. Right. And that runs from the corner by the um, uh, Norfolk Pine on the corner of Luke and Nancy's place. Yeah. And it's a discharge point for the council's stormwater retention network. Right. Now, um, this is a question to Ms. Swung. Um, uh, those glass houses and, and or um, the um, greenhouses, the, the plastic you've got over, how, how long have they been there? Um, since the, um, I think of uh, we bought this land uh, over 14 years. Yeah. And uh, about uh, uh, 10 years, yeah, about 10 years, we have uh, built one and then built a second one. We keep it, yeah. Yeah, because my observation going past there is that actually there has been increasing numbers of structures established there. It looks like you're actually, you were investing in the business quite heavily. Um, but the, the weather, you know, the weather very strong, windy. They all they keep a broken a uh, hot house. It just right. kind of yeah and yeah. But when 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 we build one and uh, use um, maybe a couple of three years and it comes very uh strong windy and then gone again. Yeah. And then we need to pay the money. Ask people come to do it. And I think in two thousand eighteen, the uh, the first week, the Saturday. Uh, early morning, the strong windy, even the pipe, the, the plastic pipe and the steel pipe, they're all broken, they all right. strained, yeah. So it's very hard to uh, um, grow vegetable layer. And outdoor, the, the soil is not good. All right. the keeps some kind of weeds, even it spray and, and cut the corn, it just keep it there. Um, right. So you're struggling to, you 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 thought it might be really good, but it's, you're struggling to make a go. Yeah, we have tried hard to want to be a rich garden, but it seems not that easy. And also sometimes it looks like a vegetable, vegetable. sometimes it looks like, okay, very good. And uh, one night a pukki coal, they come, come out <laughs> and destroy all yours. And even you planting like a broccoli, the pukki coal just uh, seems to have fun. They pull it out, <laughs> pull it out, but they're not eating, not doing anything. And at least a few years, we've been to try to want to grow some good vegetable. It, it seems very hard. And in the moment, uh, all the, um, some type of like a uh, cauliflower, broccoli, it can't grow in that garden yeah. because the root is a very big, uh, big, uh, bigger root and under and the bigger root disease. Yeah. So, so the it should be the vegetable grow very nice, not on under the ball, you know. But yeah. It's, yeah, it's very hard. Yeah. Um, and also sometimes we use a tr uh, tractor or forklift. A neighbor can play about a noisy. And uh, even a Sunday, my husband get up early to do the garden with uh, a neighbor come over and very angry says the Sunday should be sleeping, not to, not to wake you up for the noisy. And Monday to Friday, they says uh, 
and uh, for the um, the Monday to Friday, they say the, the school because the school open, uh, we can't do like a spray or anything because they say the wind they must pass the, the smelling to the school. So it can't do this, it can't do that. So it makes things very really hard. Also the the weather is not good. Also the the soil is not good. So it's very hard. Yeah. yeah. The soil if if we suffer to like a compost or some sort of things, it's easier like a living. Living there's some uh veg garden, they grow a nice vegetable, they 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 just easy to pull it out. Yeah. Um and my land in the summer days just like a rock. Yeah. Very hard. It can even the water can go so very hard, you know. So it's and, got a lot of mud content in it or something. Yeah, uh, clay content, I mean. Yeah, very hard. And they have told me you need to do this, do this, but it's very hard to do it. It's not that easy. Need it. Yeah, they asked me to grow some proper, uh, make the soil nicely, but that need to take many years to make the soil better. It's very hard. Yeah. yeah. And also, my machine is getting older, the broken. The truck is broken, this thing's broken, that thing's broken, you know. Even the the Nigel Smith, the, the one is fixed the tractor. He told me he's retired next year. And there's in Otaki, there's no one can fix the tractor. And he's been asking someone to buy his workshop, but no one wants to buy it. No one wants to work. So, so that's the trouble. Even the, even the tractor is broken. No one can fix in Otaki. Mm. Yeah. So too close to school and we think that one may be the best way to, to do other things here, not right. for the vegetable. Do you have any questions? Can I go back to a point you raised, which I may have misunderstood. You're talking about her farm being uneconomic. Um, and I, I was, thinking along the lines of whether it's big enough or too small. I mean, you made a, some reference to, you know, there's not an, it's not big enough to, yeah. yeah. And the question that was going through my mind was, what's big enough? Now, just to quantify that, now, and now I haven't heard what she said about the difficulty when actually growing things. That, that's an added complication on its own without just Worrying about the size of the of, of the land. From my experience in the Manawatu, we've found that properties which are maybe anything less than eight hectares, just it doesn't produce the income for the cost that you've got to input it to make it bigger, uh, to make it economic. So you struggle on. Um, generally, you've got to be twice that size. So you're at that level where you can afford to employ more factory type farming to make it economic to, to carry on. Um, and particularly around Palmerston North, we've seen multiple small holdings being sold or leased off to one market gardener. The other thing is traditionally the family has carried on and we've seen it now that the second or the third generation is aspiring to other things and they don't want to work 16 hours a day and I don't blame them for, for not wanting to do that. So the problem is getting the staff to do it. It has been looked at purchasing more land but then the problem is that the people who want to purchase it, who want to buy the business, can't get the staff to actually come and do it. And that, what big is your property? It's sitting on Four hectares or something, is it? Uh, yeah, just four. Yeah, uh, not even five hectares, of which is quite a bit of it you can't actually use. So, what might have been suitable, you know, 15, 20 years ago, times have moved on and it just becomes too difficult to do anything with it. But Nancy and her husband are not the type of people that want to just throw in the towel. So they're, but they're spending hours and unfortunately everyone gets old and you just can't do those hours anymore. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. Especially when the rain is coming, you know, and the, the bad weather always is so bad, so late, you know. It's just really hard to continue. And the kids, no, no one wants to do it. Yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, I understand the difficulties now that you've explained them. I hadn't, I hadn't read that into the submission or anything else that's been said um, since. Um, yeah, that, that's all I have. Thanks very much. Hi, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I see in the in the um, planner's report that um, while it's acknowledged it's in an appendix N and is an area for, for consideration, that it's actually falls with out, out of scope of this plan change. In fact, this isn't, it, while it may well be appropriate for consideration through another process or another plan change consideration, it's, um, it, 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 it doesn't fit with, with this plan change. Um, one of the other, one of the reasons is um, also because that um, other people haven't had a chance to to comment on it because it was only really the the further submissions and this is quite a significant mm. piece, size piece of land. So did you have comment on on that? Yes, I I, I realised that um, the submission wasn't put in by myself. It was um, through a a friend of Luke's. He was trying to assist. The there is a major problem in the RMA where people don't. If a council notifies a, a plan change or actually a full district plan, and there's not any, you want to include areas. You run into the problem that those areas aren't notified the general public, and it's only when the, the ability to cross submissions comes in. And generally, we've found that the only people that do comment on cross submissions are those that have actually put submissions in initially. Um, it's a bit of a fatal flaw in the system. Um, but there is still the opportunity to, con uh, as I believe, you can consider it. Um, the reasoning being that people have had the opportunity to look at those submissions and as much as you're in the at the sharp end of the whole planning procedure and I'm heavily involved in it as well. It is a dead boring subject. And you've only got to have a look at the number of, su of submissions that you receive and the number of people that it actually uh, goes out to the relationship. And it's a very small percentage. And you only get big numbers of people uh, on specific issues. Um, or I use an example, the trees in, in the main street of Fitzhubert Avenue, Palmerston North, huge um, uh, public submissions on that one there, but it's a one issue item. On the general public, they don't, they aren't interested in it until it directly affects them. Um, so I don't see it actually as a problem when they've had the opportunity to do cross submissions for a submission like, like this, there is the flexibility available. You may decide that it would only be appropriate to include Nancy's and Luke's land and not the three other owners which make up uh, a couple of hectares or nearly, nearly three hectares of land up at the corner. So that would be appropriate to exclude them. But then it makes a bit of a nonsense because you have a little piece of rural land which is hemmed in by natural features in the road, which when you start getting houses in there, they say, well, why is this not? It makes perfectly sense for it. But I do understand the reasons why it seemed to be as um, supposedly not able to be included in the submission, in the considerations. It doesn't preclude it from being considered yes, part that's of correct. wider consideration of growth. Yes. Futures only. Yeah, well, that, that's, that may be the alternative. There's a recommendation from this hearings committee that a further plan change is made to include not just this land, but all those other pieces of land towards the north of the town, which they've sought to get changed to residential. So you, you have quite a, a, uh, a large number or, or a large area, okay, by a few owners, but who actually want to see that the town expand that way. Yeah, and, and that would include wider um, community participation in the process. Well, you, you, the, the ability for community for yeah, further... Sorry, the yeah, ability yeah, for yeah, that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Whether or not it happens, who knows. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I think that's...
uh, our line of questions unless you have anything further you wanted to say. No, but I don't know whether Luke and Nancy want to speak. All right, so. It looks fine, Nancy. Yeah. That's our presentation done, thank you. Great. All right, well, we'll consider that. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And um, uh, you'll be notified of the report that we issue to the council um, where we will specifically deal with your submission. Thank you. All right, so that brings us to um, Jacinda and Daniel Foote. Welcome. So you've been here for at least a little while. Just just walked in. Okay, so yeah, that's fine. Um, so thank you. We're commissioners hearing your submission. Yep. And um, we've had a welcome from Tangata Whenua, and so we're sitting in this marae. And um, welcome. Thank you very much. So over to you as to how you want to run it. Um, so we made a further submission to our neighbours, um, submission to change their land from rural to residential. So our neighbours neighbour us at... We own a property at 76 Ruahini Street in Parapara Umu. Right. Um, it, ap well, it appears from what I've looked at that our little our little lot, which is 76, um, is surrounded by our neighbours. And our neighbours in, in Ruahini Street own mm, in front of the quarry, loop around our property, and then from our property, which is 76, right the way through to Boat City. And they have requested that their land, which is currently rural, to be um, rezoned residential. Um, our current little little lot of 8,094 square metres is currently rural. And if we got left rural, um, that would be an interesting, interesting problem for us to overcome if they were rezoned residential. So if that was my belief that that was... Right. Can I just get your address again that you were? 76 Ruahini Street in Parapara Umu. Um, and not that I've had any dealings with our neighbours, Francis Holdings Limited. So my understanding is they own, you were looking at the Eastern Hills. Oh, I see. They own in front of the quarry in Parapara Umu. Yeah. A little slither of land behind our land. Yeah. And then they own the land right the way through to what we call Boat City, which um, is on the old state highway, the old main road. Right. So you're um, back from Our Lady of Parapara Umu there in that corner by the quarry? Yes. Yep. I've got you. Thank you. It's called the old milk station. It was owned by the council many years ago as the milk depot. Yeah. They built it in 64 or 65. Right. And so the people below you are seeking residential, which would? Um, so my understanding, which was Francis Holdings Limited, is they've made a submission to have their land rezoned residential. And what are the impacts or concerns that you have about that? Well, we support that, so yeah. we would like oh, you, do. you to include us in this. And I'm here really to, you know, put my case forward that it should be residential as well. Yeah. Um, and and the reasons why it should be residential. Really, I'm happy. Right. To go so you're, you you didn't actually submit on this initially yourself. No, we didn't. Um, and then we made a further submission to support this. Right. So you I want? I feel like you, you were going to forget us in this little slot because we're sort of there. And their land goes around us. Um, from the quarry, hmm. and and it is rural, and it is a, a commercial building or a, a 
concrete building and one residential house on that side of the street and only from the quarry north everything south is residential and everything west of it is residential just checking what the No. Quarry, yes, yes, yep, yep, it is currently. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they've accepted that. Yeah. But, and they hadn't said that they had. And so that's why I was like, well, it felt like when I looked at all the maps and looked at all of the... That yeah, no that's quite had. a hard thing to navigate. And, we, and I was told by the council that they hadn't and that I should make a further submission to ensure... Well, they may have done that in response to your further submission. I'm so, not sure. Well, nobody had said anything to us. So I was like, right, I'm just going to come along and say, these are why we should make it. But I, there was no maps or anything that, or anybody at the council that had Right, said that so Mr. Had. Banks, who's the consultant planner, directly opposite, you know, the young face. <laughs> oh, there's two young people. The young faces over yeah, there. Yeah. One with the... Not the young one with a lot of hair on the <laughs> I was going to call him four eyes, but I remember that's a lake. <laughs> Um, and, and so, yeah, everything I've looked at, it, it, no one has included this little <laughs> dot that we own. Well, he's written a report and he has recommended that your zoning be adjusted to include your property. Thank you. There's nothing to stress about. <laughs> well, other than that, we have to agree with him. But Okay. And I can give you a whole lot of reasons. I've got another hat that I could put on. I want. There are I, a lot more controversial things on your side. Of I know, <laughs> I know that, but they, okay, and that might be true, but I do property management. I yeah. currently have twenty six residential rentals that I own, of which half of them are community and social housing. I want to provide more co community and social housing on that site. Yeah, that's what I want to use it for. And if you'd missed us because we were such a small little spot, I wanted somebody to listen. Yeah, that's why we made this submission. Good on you to ensure that we didn't get forget, forgotten because it's rural land. Yeah. So if you've listened, that's great. You didn't have to come. Oh, I tell you what, it's it, yeah, it's a wonderful little spot and um, and I'm very passionate about housing. So for me, if I wanted to have my five cents worth, if you could tell the council to enable us to not have to pay all the council fees to build social housing, and they came and joined and made a community housing scheme there. I'll be like, hey, Tangata, right opposite Boat City. Do you know about that? Anyway, no, yes, you know, that's what I want. All right. Well, um, that makes complete sense. And um, uh, all things going well, we'll just follow what Mr. Banks has suggested. Can I not say oh, I wanted it done? <laughs> Can I take the credit for that? Thank you. Oh, he hasn't been, yeah. hasn't been a waste of time. But Not at all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that takes us to 12, uh, or we're a little bit ahead of time, aren't we? Um, to lunch break. Um, where are we lunching? Tangaroa? Tiangaroa, is it? Yeah. Okay, and then um, this afternoon we have Kaingaora. Right.
So welcome everybody. Um, and this is the afternoon session of our first day in the Whāranui. Um, and we welcome uh, Kainga Auras who are making a submission this afternoon. And uh, my name is John Marson and I'm chairing this panel with Commissioner Black and Commissioner Kirikiri. And uh, so we're here to hear the submission and report back to the council. So welcome. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, tēnā te mihi atu ki te mana whenua o te Whanganui Atara. Uh, ki te kai ko mihana nei, tēnā koutou, uh, ko Jennifer Caldwell, maua ko Natalie Summerfield, a tūne mō kainga ora. It's a privilege to be here on the marae today uh, and uh, so um, comfortable and warm uh, in a very blustery, <laughs> blustery Wellington day. Um, uh, speaking as someone who's just blowing in from Auckland very early this morning. Um, thank you also for accommodating our request for a substantial chunk of your time. Um, we appreciate that um, very much. And as you'll hear shortly, uh, Kainga Ora has a lot invested in this process because of the nature of its very broad statutory mandate. And you'll hear a little bit more about that uh, later this afternoon. Um, we have uh, four witnesses. Uh, you've seen their evidence. Um, I have provided uh, some legal submissions, but to be honest, there's not a lot of scope for legal debate, I would have thought, on the things that we want to put before you. Uh, where you're in the lucky, uh, the privileged position of being one of the least troublesome councils that we're dealing with at the moment, uh, in that um, we are pretty aligned, I think, with uh, your offices in terms of how to approach walkable catchments, for example. Uh, we're also pretty aligned on what you've done with your qualifying matters, uh, and you'll hear from our witnesses that we're taking a very pragmatic approach to your coastal hazard qualifying matter. Uh, so there's not a lot of uh, debate that needs to occur in terms of the basis on which you've developed those. We are certainly having those sorts of debates in other council hearing processes. Uh, so uh, really the legal submissions just set out a brief statutory context um, and then identify the areas where uh, Kainga Ora uh, is satisfied with the recommendations made in the section 42A uh, and also matters where Kainga Ora has amended its position from its original submission and then focused in on summarising those aspects where we still think there is room for improvement in the provisions. Uh, and um, I, I mean I've set out some, some broad section 32 principles for example. Um, I would like to just explore briefly with you this notion that um, the intensification directives uh, in the NPSUD in particular are to be regarded as starting points rather than maximum, maxima. Uh, but other than that, there's not a lot I want to draw to your attention in legal terms. So I'm in your hands, uh, Commissioner, Commissioners, uh, if you would like to um, me to take you through some of those high-level summary matters before handing over to the witnesses, we can do that. If you have questions for me, I'm happy to answer those. Um, well, the way we've been running this hearing is a little bit like a tutorial. Um, where we sort of float our ideas and pick things up and engage with the witnesses and the team to get the best out of them because we have read the material. Um, and uh, as a participant in the um, uh, Auckland Council process of deliberation, I agree with you and just sum that back briefly. Um, there might uh, be some legal points that emerge, but I think they more fruitfully need to be considered in the context of the exchange of witnesses. I, I don't, I agree with you, I don't think there's anything that stands out as being majorly um, controversial in the NPSUD. And I do like the idea of exploring the starting point for the discussion, but it, it may be lightly. Uh, I'm not sure how much that matters, but. Um, Sorry, thanks. Um, that's how we'd like to proceed, um, is just to talk to the witnesses and, and get an understanding. And I guess it's good to negotiate a set of topics because um, some witnesses will come in on topics because they'll be strictly planning matters, like whether we use precincts or zones and all those sorts of things, which are quite technical. 
uh, and planning related and others that uh, are predicated on what I would describe as your under, underlying theory of the case, which, as I understand it, is um, really contained within Mr. Cullen's evidence, which is this is how you measure your capacity demand and need. And I don't think, I'm not demonstrating you're going to get there. And that gives some support to the idea of greater heights or intensification. And so that's the theory of the case supported by evidence that I want to explore. But it does raise a slight um, legal question or planning question that arose in my mind that I might as well put up out there, which is um, how much that theory of the case um, is, is one that really lies behind the, the broader question of, of implementation of the MPSUD itself as a totality, as opposed to the narrower question of uh, are we doing the job for an ISP through the streamlined process that meets the objectives of an ISP? And the, and the reason I'm making that distinction is whether, in my mind, and you'll appreciate that we've had to absorb a lot of material in this process. Um, in my mind, Section 80E contemplates an ISP for fundamentally Policy 3 and the MDRS, which is not so much about what Mr. Cullen is talking about. It seemed to me, which is a broader question of, are you going to achieve the wider outcomes of the MPSUD? And I'm not sure that's entirely why we're sitting here. So that's a, a question that I would like to explore and engage with, is, is, is whether um, this is the right place to assess total housing demand. And the reason I ask that question is because the council is going to go through a future rezoning. And so in Otaki, we've heard that the future urban zone is potentially going to go from Te Rapraha Street to the current edge of the coastal area. And all of that capacity is yet potentially to be determined in implementing MPSUD. So whether we would at this juncture make the assumption we will not achieve that result and therefore the only outcome is additional height is one that I'm, I'm not sure about. So I'd prefer to be up front and say that's one question is, 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 th is there a congruence between this process uh, and, and the arguments that Mr. Cullen is making? So um, the short answer to your point is we'd like to get into the witnesses in a logical way. And Would start. you like to hear from Mr. Cullen first, if that's the case? Um, and I had proposed to call Mr. Singh first, just yeah. to give you a sense of Kaying Order's uh, mandate and why it's here and why, why this process is so important to it. Then go to uh, Mr. Ray on urban design, then to Mr. Cullen, and then finally to Ms. Wilson on planning. Well, um, is that a format you wanted to follow? I had a diff slightly different one, but that's fine. Well, I, I'll just float this idea and see which one the panel chooses. Um, my idea was to go to the technical planning questions about zoning precincts and all of that technical stuff. Then to go to uh, um, or to, um, Mr. Cullen and then or, and then specifically to Otaki areas that I'm interested in and then para para umu. But what do you think? All right. So does that make sense? Well, first we'll deal with the sort of technical planning questions of zoning, precincts, and all that structure so that we've got an understanding of the differences there. Then we could go um, to Mr. Cullen and the broader theory of the case uh, and that, and then we would come down into specific localities and, and how that fits together. Does that make a sense? I think we can make that work. Yeah. All right, so your that case I'll ask Ms. Wilson. Yeah, uh, Ms. Williams. Sorry, Williams. Yeah, come forward.
They're welcome, Ms. Williams. Uh, and the way we do this is we just sort of have a conversation with you and and discuss things. Um, and I'll I'll kick that off, and then my other commissioners will have questions as well. Um, the first topic is um, nomenclature framework sort of questions. The the key difference, as I understand it, between you and the council is that you'd prefer to have um, uh, areas where the MDRS and and precinct A apply zoned rather than described as precincts, and any height variations affecting those particular areas being dealt with as a height variation control um, as opposed to the precinctual approach um, and um, I sort of understand that because my experience with precincts is that they tend to be uh, for a particular area and focused about getting the optimal development identifying the opportunities and constraints of an area rather than describing um, a broad um, land enablement uh, framework. So I understand the zone there. I understand also that the council officer has, has, has somewhat pushed back on that in terms of how much complexity it introduces into the plan. But you've come up with a hybrid approach, which is as I understand it, you want to go to a high density, you want a high density zone in those areas that are identified as precinct A. And then you want um, the you have the general residential zone um, and then a, effectively a height variation control within that, um, which I thought was somewhat attractive because um, it 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 used the, the it didn't use the precinct tool. Uh, in in a way that is probably not as entirely congruent with the standards as as your approach. Um, so, I guess the virtue what you were trying to pitch at there was to say, okay, well, if you don't want three chapters in the zone, at least have two. And presumably, the idea is the character of precinct A is so different from the general residential zone that really it does warrant a discrete chapter because for example when you're talking about home occupations I mean the whole concept of site just gets thrown out the door and it's a whole different paradigm is that the essence of what I, I capture in it yeah that, that's that's correct so it's effectively um it's creating a plan framework that's legible um as, as a first step so having a high density zone separate from the general residential zone it, it sets a very clear direction around the type of development the planned urban built environment for that context rather than having it um, caught up within a precinct approach within the general residential zone um, and it's it's a sum of all parts so it's it's not just within the zone provisions themselves the policies within the zones but it's also within the district objectives in the urban form uh, development policies where there's a lot more articulation quite clearly around that planned urban built form and what the outcomes are um, which makes it a, a much more of a legible planning framework for for users of the plan certainly users who who aren't council based and don't interact with the plan on a daily basis um, it, it's just sets a, a much clearer um, framework around that so that high density residential zone does that does that um how does that apply across existing zones like how does that work with existing zones like it, w what sort of types of zoning would it affect it's effectively located where the uh, proposed residential precinct a areas are located and in any additional areas that Mr. Ray is recommending within within that context. Right. So, um, so it's it's pulling out those intensification areas from the general residential areas and, and specifically locating them within their own plan. Um, and then the the concept would as as you've identified the concept would also see the removal of precinct B, which is the 14 metre height variation location around um, the the local centres and just having that work as a height variation standard within the general residential chapters. Right. And do you think that that 
height variation control is sufficient to give people who might want to take advantage of height in precinct B uh, a sufficient mechanism to do so? Yeah, I, 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 I do think it achieves that. It's, it's, a, it's a three metre height extension from the baseline within that zone. Um, it's a fairly commonly used tool to, to signal where that additional height is, is enabled. It works within the policy framework within the general residential chapter in my view as well, so. Right. So um, I've seen the height variation control operate, um, but I haven't specifically crafted applications in response to it, but you, it's, you think it's a perfectly valid tool? Yes, absolutely. And it's a tool that other councils are using within the region and, and across the country in this context. So it's certainly not, um, it's not against the tide of, of what's being used elsewhere. Yeah. And so, um, in terms of the, uh, the um, way that would mean we operate in terms of the plan, the areas within precinct B would be identified by what? By an overlay as H? Correct. Correct. Yes. So yeah. within the planning maps that are included within Mr. Ray's um, evidence, it just just shows it as a red area with a with a hatched um, uh, overlay, mm -hmm. and that's also within. Um, the height variation control would apply in the general residential areas where the 14 metre uplift is enabled. And we're also proposing it in the high density zone around the metropolitan centre zone. Uh, we were proposing a 36 metre height limit yeah, above, yeah. above the 22. So it's the same tool, but just used in across different zones. Right. And um, so that, that hybrid means um, you've got and that you're not describing the M, the general residential zone as a medium density residential zone, but given that this act effectively converts everything now into a medium, whether we call it medium or general, everyone's going to be clear. Yes. Yeah. And look, yeah, I, I would, I would absolutely support it being called a medium density zone. It is really what it is. Um, I guess there was a degree of, um, uh, compromise if, if you like in terms of the rework uh, they're noting that the coastal um, qualifying matter precinct is within that area it's about 155 hectares as I understand it so there's a good balance of land within that zone that isn't going to be enabled at a medium density context so that was the rationale for I guess um, supporting the ongoing use of the term and, and zone framework of general residential but I absolutely would um, would endorse and support, you know, that it being a medium density zone pure. Uh, I think that that would align with the planning standard. Yeah. So, but but I mean, we may all now after this exercise think of generative residential as being medium density. So, but it, um, in terms of the objectives of the general residential zone, um, does the retention of that hybrid approach somewhat overcome the problems of of too many zones or so forth or it seems to me that the, the, the hybrid is quite an attractive option yeah I, I think um i think it creates some ease if you like in in terms of being able to um directly um and clearly give effect to what the NPSUD outcomes are from creating a high density zone while still providing for the rest of the balance of the residential land within that general residential zone. Is one 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 of the things that we're contending with is the fact that um, uh, we've got a district which has had this MDRS uh, exercise put on it, um, and it's got a, hazards. It's got coastal. Uh, issues that it will need to confront to enable appropriate development and um, all of these things are identified either sorry as qualifying identified qualifying matters and they're quite extensive one advantage of calling the general residential zone as opposed to the medium density residential zone is in a way not to make a signal that well we've actually I through this exercise essentially identified everything as suitable for that development so do you know what I mean like it it sort of adds another layer to say 
we're comfortable with the qualifying matters, but it would be a leap to say we're thinking everything is now uh, median density. It's still a general residential zone with those constraints, but it now has those opportunities where the qualifying matters don't apply. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, I think that that aligns um, with with the rationale around, um, you know, continuing to call it a general residential zone in, in light of the, the scale and significance of that qualifying matter area across the urban environment in, yeah. in this region. Um, obviously, the MDRS, where there is no qualifying matter, does enable a full medium density yeah. outcome. Um, yeah. But, yes, yeah, certainly acknowledging there is... Um, a good portion of, of the environment, urban environment, yeah. that is covered by that qualifying matter. Yeah, and so um, just as a matter of interest in Auckland, are you, because I know there's a sort of typology there of uh, FAB, um, medium density, I think, suburban density and single housing. <laughs> are you are you wanting to call that medium density across the board where it applies? Is that how you're approaching it? Sorry, was your question with regard to the Auckland? Yeah, oh, are you not doing that job? No, <laughs> okay. I'm not, sorry, no. Don't worry then. It's a slightly uh, tangential question. All right, so that's, um, and, and you've provided a suite of provisions that would apply in the high density residential zone. And, and that, does that have its own set of policies and objectives? That, it does, yeah, it does have a, um, it's, or does it replicate it's more? It's pulled across the um, the district yeah. objectives and the um, from yeah. So it's pulled across the district objectives as I've recommended amendments within Appendix A of my chapter. So those those objectives do have some amendments that I have recommended, uh, which would apply obviously across both the general residential and the high density mm. zone framework. Um, I think on that matter, it's probably worth actually noting and. Um, a discrepancy that I think needs to be clarified and just made clear for your benefit is the amendment to um, district objective uh, 011 within my high density chapter that I've recommended uh, does show a, a further amendment in a different version from actually the, the change that I've made within appendix A. Yeah. So that's, um, that's just a, um, that is an error. I would suggest you go with the Appendix A version and carry that through to uh, the high density. Um, there was obviously a time where I was looking to remove a lot more from that objective. And on, and, and re on reflection, I've, I've uh, Appendix A. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just refer you to that. So it's on page two of my appendix A. I'm suggesting that that um, district objective 11 is, is the correct version to carry across both zone frameworks. Um, it does differ from the district objective 11 within the high density zone chapter that I've provided, which is on page. Page two also, you'll see the version uh, in the high density chapter is a lot more condensed. It's taken out a lot of that, uh, the numerated version of, of that objective. So I'm suggesting that that remains in okay um so so let's just take it take us through in that context what what happens now in in, in the chap in the chapters so if we go to appendix a1 you have um amendments to the um district's objectives chapter correct yeah and you, you announce as an objective that you're going to have zones <laughs> as opposed to precincts and you identify um, uh, that um, in the urban built character our buildings up to at least six stories within the high density zone and buildings up to four stories 
within the general residential zone. So the critical components of that change, the objective, uh, first of all, that you've changed zone, precincts to zones um, and you've put at least six storey to signify that that's a starting, or at least that that's not uh, a constraint, it's a, an opportunity. Correct, yes, and that that's, um, that's, in my view, consistent with the NPSUD direction that these areas provide for at least six storeys. And is, than... sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I have to apologise. <laughs> um, I, I walk, work across all domains, freshwater, coastal, <laughs> and land use, so I'm not I'm not only in land use planning, sure. but does the word at least come out of the NPSUD? Yes. Yeah. Right. And so, um, whereas for precinct or the general, it's up to four stories. Yeah, there's not the same directive. Um, so the four story um, enabled intensification is in context of 3D, mm -hmm. policy 3D of the MPSUD. So policy um, uh, 3A, B and C speaks of at least mm -hmm. six stories. And then um, and then there's 3D, which is commensurate with the scale of the activities within that commercial area. Well, um, on that point, um, do the words at least in the direction signal to councils a minimum, but then require them to go away and assess the character of the area to determine what the level should be? So what's commensurate with that level? So, so the, the commensurate test is at 3D, so that there's no at least. Um, requirement at, at that clause so that's right yeah yeah sorry I'm I'm just I'll just open the uh, I'm just wondering whether the response the council would make to that proposition is we agree that it should be at least six that's as far that we can't go below that but beyond that it's a mis question of assessment of character and and it is within our power to say well, actually, six stories is commensurate with the character. Is that? Am I wrong about that? What policy we're on? So it's it's within. Um, Okay. okay, now that clarifies it. Sorry, that that was a that was a false starting question. <laughs> um, all right, so I und I understand that. So um, you're saying that's necessary to give direction the di follow the direction. Yes, and and within that, um, we are we are um, supporting and recommending that there is an area where additional height should be explicitly provided for around the metropolitan centre. So um, a, a 10 storey height limit is what we're recommending around the metropolitan centre. I understand that. Um, there is the broader question though of well-functioning urban environments and, and that does raise a question about um, how to manage height that would be excessive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I get that. And then you go to um, I just had a question about the height variation control. Um, the height variation control does operate as a maximum, doesn't it? So you don't exceed the limit that's set by the HBC. Correct. The height variation control provides that really will have a height limit, and the height variation control provides for that in identified locations the additional. Yeah. So once you exceed the limit, 
the policies start to suggest you're actually out, you need to be consented to or that it's out of character? In other words, what does it force? It's, it's basically just enabling and directing a greater intensity in certain locations. So it's saying within these identified areas, um, it's been determined that additional height would, would be acceptable as a general concept within these areas. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my point is this. Um, you might have a high level of confidence that anything more than the HVC was inappropriate. Whereas you might, in the uh, high density residential zones, form the view that um, six is a starting point and anything else needs to be assessed or whatever, or you might have a different number, whatever that is. It's a slightly different flavor because um, it's more contextual where, where the, the, a development that's higher than six stories could be a good idea. Do you know what I mean? It's like, um, so I, I feel like there might be a difference there that the HVC um, has some sort of stronger teeth in the, uh, but maybe not, I don't know. But. I mean, it's certainly directing um, where that additional height is is seen to be uh, more appropriate, and then there's the the design considerations that are automatically going to be uh, a function and, and a part of any assessment, whether you're six stories or, or ten stories. The the um, design outcomes and the design assessment will be a, a, a critical component um, in in either context. So. Um. I guess I'm just exploring this because uh, this is how I prefer to work. But um, you're proposing an HBC in the high density residential zone, or are you setting the standard of? We're we're proposing an HBC just in a quite a defined area around the metropolitan centre zone. So within a basically a 400 metre um, catchment of the yeah. metro centre zone, we're proposing um, additional height be enabled specifically in that area. Um, and then the other one is the the form of well, what we consider the form of precinct B around the local centres. Right, yeah. Um, okay, well, we'll have to, when we get to those areas, identify where that HVC applies in the, that specific parts of the metropolitan zone and so forth. Um, yeah, we, we can go to Mr. Ray's, the, it's all within Mr. Ray's maps, if that's... Uh, we will in a sure. minute. I'll just go through the text of this. But um, is there a potential way, um, like there seems to be a difference of opinion between uh, you and the council about how much additional height should be accommodated. And maybe the question is whether the HVC should operate as a limit with the starting point being the councils and some form of assessment up to the HVC or something like that or some other technique to because it's contextual, isn't it? It it needs to you need to assess it. I think the um the, the areas where there's perhaps some difference between what we're proposing and the council is the HVC around the local centres. There's no real difference in that context. It's just a different tool rather than a precinct. Um, we are proposing the HVC around the metropolitan centre zone, which the council isn't proposing any additional height, and that that you know that that could be through um, a toggle activity status, perhaps as as an alternative way of doing that. So enable up to a certain amount as a restricted activity, and then beyond that, you go to a discretionary activity. And, you know that's that's a different model that that could incorporate. What we're saying is actually we. In our view, we, you know, we've identified locations that can hold that additional height. So um, just effectively clearly build that into the framework um, around the around the metro centre as a HVC. Mm. Okay. Um, well, um, finish the black powder in design is so good for that uh, in more detail, but um, Moving to DO011, you've got this unique identity, character and values. You've made some changes there. My question is, do you agree that Otaki has a distinctive character? 
Um, look, in my, in my view, it's a, it's a, it's a small town centre with a, with a, um, with a surrounding community. Um, um, I, I haven't, I haven't heard the, I guess what's come before in terms of what that unique character may may be within Ōtaki that you specifically refer to. Okay, so uh, are you aware that Ōtaki has a very distinctive tangata whenua component yes. um, and has a history associated with that that goes back effectively to the Treaty of Rotangi right. and patterns of development? And so there is a distinctive Māori flavour here that you will not find, or at least I'm not aware of, in any other community along this coast. I mean, you find it in smaller packs, but not as distinctive. And then there have been patterns of development like the Wānanga and the sorts of things. There's a history there mm -hmm. that identifies a culture and a heritage and an ancestral connection that isn't obvious entirely by built form, but is very present to the people in the mm. community. Yep. Do you agree that that could potentially be an aspect of identity or culture that we need to consider? Uh, look, yes, I, I mean, through section um, six, I absolutely agree that we need to recognize and provide for, for areas of, with, with cultural values and yep. identified cultural values. So absolutely acknowledge that. Okay, um, well, I'll come back to that um, when we talk about the housing uh, and or the proposals specifically for Ōtaki, but um, uh, then if we look at the urban built form, is it is it UFDPX that it really bites in terms of policy direction about height? Yes, yeah, that's... Um... Yes, I'd say that's where it's quite clearly articulated within there. So the idea is then anything within a walkable catchment of the MCZ, including buildings of at least six storeys and up to 10 storeys. Um, and the words and up to suggest that, that, that potentially you need to assess something. You know, there is some form of assessment required. Is that... How it works? Yeah, there would absolutely be an assessment. I mean, there would be an assessment even at your at least six stories component. So, any any proposal with more than three units is going to be requiring an assessment. And when you came up to that figure at ten stories, am I right that the principal uh, planning basis for that proposal? is the need to supply for housing demand based on Mr. Cullen's evidence? Or is it informed by a wider sense of character assessment and how those would operate? In other words, how do you get to 10 stories yeah. knowing that? It's, um, so it's stepping back a little bit further, I would say. So it's recognizing that the Metropolitan Centre operates within a regional context at, at that scale recognized as having that um, that that level of um, uh, service in the center's hierarchy and across across the region um, and around other metropolitan center zones there's the same uh, enablement uh, being sought around metropolitan center zones throughout the Wellington region um, even you know more more broadly across the country, so it's recognising that that's that's the key focal commercial centre for the region, or for the for the district, and around that you hang your greatest level of density, or you enable your greatest level of density around that area. So would I be right to say that the assessment that you've made is principally based on functional? role. In other words, the designation of it as the MCZ and how that works in a regional context means it may not look like that now, but that is its inspected function. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Now, um, the walkable catchment, including buildings at six stories and uh, sorry, up to at least six stories in Kaipapareki, Tarapurungi, and Waikanae, those that's rapid transport uh, assessments, isn't it? So that doesn't include Otaki. No, that's correct. So those are um, policy 3C yeah. areas. Now, um, Wondering why four has got six stories on it, because I thought that town centres was was four. Is that not Mr. Banks? Is it four or six? We're proposing to have an idea. So why is your four not the six not not in blue? Um, I have to refer. Sorry, to the forty-two. Jacob to oh, so proposed uh, the oh. the notified version sort six stories within the town centre right. zone and four stories around it. Yeah, and so what kind of order seeking are six and six. Right. Okay, I've got you. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then why do you add seven? Is that seven still appropriate in the hybrid model? Oh, this is the high density. Oh, I see, enabling greater development. Out. What does that mean? Yes, yeah, enabling so, greater development outcomes in the high density residential zone. So it's effectively again, it, it's the sum of all parts. Really, this is this is again reaffirming at that at the district wide level through the, these policies that the high density zone is where that greater urban built form outcome is, is expected, rather than within the general residential one. So it's just reaffirming that the high density zone has quite a different built form outcome. But wouldn't wouldn't uh, the high density zone be a method to achieve one to six, five, six? Uh, yes, but it's um, so recognising that the point above it is is included to say that the the general residential zone is um, providing for for a. I guess a medium density context. So this is just explicitly noting again that the high density zone is, is where you're going to get that greater intensification. So it's coming, it's coming through from those preceding points that, that you've identified. Yeah. Okay. It's just reaffirming that. Right. And then the other provisions are really just consequential. But when you come to UFDP 13, um, am I right that the only qualifying matter in those precincts is the Mara, Marae Takiwa precinct? There are other precincts, but they're not qualifying matters per se. So within the legal submissions, there was a, an amended version of the high density zone chapter provided. Um, I have a couple of copies here if, if you need a copy of those um, which identified that actually there was also other precincts that hadn't been included which were the beach residential precinct and the Waikanae garden precinct so it's just including those as well um, so they would they would be in there as well Yes, but then they, they don't operate as a qualifying matter per se. They're just a policy direction. There's no particular rules ascribed to those precincts. Right. Yeah, okay. All right. Um,
and then you've then you've does your appendix a capture this hybrid position or is it it does um so it captures the general residential am amendments and then appendix c is the high density right provisions yeah okay all right well we might um return to that but but well i'll just have a look at these new high density provisions so that's appendix c So the um, the appendix C high density zone within my evidence bundle was there were a couple of small revisions that were made and that was provided with the legal subs um, appended in there. So I, I can provide a copy, but it is also like the, the policy or the objective that I referred to earlier, DO011. Um, the one that requires amendment to match appendix A, that's that's also within the legal subversion. So basically the appendix A version of that provision is the correct one. Right. It's a district wide objective, so it carries across both zones. Do you want to give me that hard copy now? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so we can provide an updated version to that just for, for absolute clarity. So no, that was it was a it was a point I know I I just spotted this morning. Yes, this does have some updates and I can take you through it, but they're basically um so that these were covered off in the legal subs, but I can just quickly take you through what the updates are were from my Um, well, just tell me how the rule screen works in terms of the height issue. <laughs> so the height issue, it's effectively just um, carrying across the same rule framework as in the general residential um, zone, mm -hmm. obviously without the precinct um, approach. Yeah. This is really just the same residential zone, but with some. It's, yeah, it's it, it, it's trying to, for simplicity. It, it's creating exactly the same zone framework where it's appropriate, um, but making it a high density version. So and, I'll just um. And so um, a lot of the policies and stuff will also be the same. It's really just that that look, although it's coloured blue, there's a lot of repetition. Correct. Yeah. Correct. A lot of yeah. That's right. So and that's that's correct. So I'll just um, put the mic down and just find that height rule for you. So the height rule is at um, HRZRX1. HRZRX1. Correct, yes. So that's this is the um I guess the general um it's where all of the density standards are. Um and again it, it's it's similar to what you see in the general residential zone, but um some amendments specific to the high density outcomes that we're seeking. So 21 meters is specified there at uh, 2.A and then at 2.B uh, 36 meters we are identified within the height variation control. So that's the area around the metropolitan zone. OK. 
sorry, I just can't. See. Oh, I see. Hi, yeah. So you're contemplating that there'd be 20, 36 meters identified in the planning maps as a HBC, but otherwise, if you're a high density residential zone, it's 21 meters. Across the balance, correct. And you're contemplating this being uh, 21 meters along Waikanae, Parapara Umu and Paikokarehi? Correct. And, and 36 um, meters in the metropolitan center zone. Within a 400 meter catchment of the metropolitan zone. Right. The other key change between the general residential zone and the high density zone, which I think is perhaps one of the more critical changes is the height in relation to boundary control. Yeah. So seeking a much more explicit enabling framework to actually achieve and enable the six story outcome that the high density zone. So what was that? So providing for a, a much more explicit and enabling uh, height in relation to boundary control to actually um, provide for that urban built form to be achieved on a site. So the general residential zone just has the standard application of the four and 60 degree mm -hmm. MDRS prescribed standard we're proposing um, a much more enabling standard where if you're providing intensification on a site, so at least four or more dwellings, providing for a 19 meter height in relation to boundary starting point for the first 22 meters of a site. Um, and then where, um, as you get further into the site, toggling that back, um, and then where there's any interface issues, um, applying the MDRS four meter and 60 degree. So. Page nine. So just tell me how you think the council's height in relation to boundary will uh, constrain development in the areas which are identified for height. So I, I, I mean, in my view, it won't, it won't easily enable a six-story built form. Um, it's much more restrictive. It will require much greater setbacks from from boundaries. So you'll need you'll need to amalgamate a lot. You'll need to amalgamate more sites to achieve the built form outcomes that the zone is explicitly anticipating. And um, so you're you're saying that that actually the total amount of you're 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 anticipating that to achieve the um, objectives of the enablement, there will be some short-term pain for long-term gain in the sense that there will be some people who get much more height overshadowing them. But realistically, if you're trying to get to that function, there is going to be short-term pain for long-term gain. Is that the the essence of it? Effectively, the the high density zone is an area where a much greater urban an intensive built form outcome is, is anticipated and, and directed. So correct, to achieve that, there is going to be a change in amenity values for people in the existing context, absolutely. And, that, and that's recognized again within the MPSUD. But um, I'm sorry, I'm not over the, um, the numbers about how that all works, but um, would it create sufficient separation between tall buildings to create amenity? Like, does it how, how does it work appropriately in in the context of creating appropriate built form? Yeah, Mr. Ray's evidence goes into it, to this in a bit more detail, but effectively, it works in concert with a, in my view, with a site coverage standard of fifty percent site coverage. There's still an expectation that across the site, there's a there are areas of the site that aren't covered with tall buildings that create access to openness and light. Um, but effectively, in a, in a high density um, zone, that is the area where a much greater urban built form is anticipated. So it's, it's recognizing that there is a, 
it's part of that paradigm shift, I guess, in terms of what level of enabled development can occur in, in that setting. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that there is a paradigm shift. I'm just trying to visualize. It would be great to have a couple of pictures that says, this is what a town center with this type of level of control has, and this is what one looks like. Because to me, it's yeah. like what we're interested in is, is how the two land in practical form. Mr. Ray's evidence is, is probably the, I would say the location where, where you're going to get a bit more detail around that. He includes some attachments with some modeling of, of the different scenarios. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Ray, I've forgotten that already, <laughs> but it'll be useful to be reminded of it so we understand that. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, that'd be good. Um. Uh, kia ora and good afternoon, thank you. Um, so the, it's a bit of a different approach. So one of the issues we have with height and height in relation to boundaries is that when you put a smaller or a lower height in relation to boundary on a boundary, and it, it pushes the height further away from that boundary. It's pretty, pretty basic. Um, and what we've found is that um, that ends up pushing a building along a site rather than across a site. So if you can imagine, let's just say it's a 20 meter wide site and it's 35 meters long for argument's sake. Um, uh, building a six story building, typically um, apartment buildings will build um, in a, an efficient way, which is the same floor plate generally vertically from a cost perspective, water type perspective, et cetera. So that um, ends up pushing the building away from the boundaries from both sides. And if you, I think it's, I think it's right to say, if it's four and sixty, it's about eight meters away to get that sort of height. That starts to say then, well, I'm going to turn all my balconies sideways, and and have the outlook spaces, which are only four meters, um, facing side boundaries. So what what this nineteen and sixty um, option tries to achieve is actually turning that around and saying we actually want buildings to front the street um, in a more continuous form rather than a break building break building um, where the outlook of those you, so say for example you might have a 20 meter wide building or slightly less uh, you might have uh, through site um, type apartments where you might have back-to-back -back type apartments so some might front the street, some might front the rear yard. Um, and in that case, you've got control over who you're overlooking, which is your backyard or the street. And we want to try and maximize the, as many people overlooking the street from a, a surveillance perspective. Um, but also, uh, and, and then you end up with a fairly, fairly um, short sidewall, which is taller, uh, and, and, and avoiding um, the need to put activities so it could effectively be I'll say blank but designed well could have windows that are, are frosted or, or they let light but not necessarily the main um, outlook space so rather than it's trying to push the views and the outlook from an apartment to the rear or to the street rather than to the side and so we're talking about this building separation is actually much greater if you think of a back-to-back -back, uh, block structure. Okay. So there's so what sort of describe the way of the house Sorry. Um, so you're saying in most in these locations, we're dealing with not large sites. So you're trying to force large sites with open space. What you're trying to force is a sort of linear development, which is forward looking to the street or back to the thing. That's correct. So it, it, yeah, what, why? it doesn't stop the, the, the other um, outcome happening, but it, yeah. it enables it and, and um, uh, and rather than trying to step a built form in that in that height in relation to boundary, which is more restrictive, it's saying actually, why don't you do it at the front? And here's here's some good parameters for which you can do that in. 
Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's the one. Um, I guess this is a difficult, I'm not necessarily a question, but an observation. Why, why is there not agreement about amongst urban designers and, and architects about <laughs> these things? Because it strikes me as it should be reasonably uh, accepted amongst a profession that a particular, when you're moving, transitioning to a higher density zone from existing form, you have a view about which standards generate the most optimal outcomes. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I find it strange in the 21st century, mm. there's debate about that. Can you explain to me why there is debate about it? I think it comes down to what the planned built form outcome that different parties want. Um, in Wellington, uh, the, um, plan, uh, the urban designer for council and I have agreed on those principles in terms of Wellington's context uh, in a joint witness statement just recently. So y there is some agreement in some of us, <laughs> um, but it, it comes down to the, um, what is that planned outcome that we want to achieve in these zones? Because you can use all these different techniques to create different outcomes. And it's, it's actually getting to the fundamentals of what is the form that we're expecting? What do we really want to make or control, right? Because that's effectively what the plan is doing. Um, and, uh, um, and, and using a, a lower height um, um, is more appropriate in a more suburban type setting where you, you might s separate buildings further or mm. um, in that regard. And look, um, that's quite, we're, we're also based whether there should be side yards, for example, in, in, in these zones. And um, from an urban design perspective and an efficiency of the site, if, you, if you're looking at building across the site frontage, then one metre side guard really doesn't, doesn't have much benefit at all. You might as well have an abutting building. Right. So let, let's, let's say um, that you can be more efficient as a developer to say, I will, I will build in the way that you're describing. I'll have balconies out to the street, observation of the street, and balconies out the back. Mm -hmm. Conceptually, if you would be building large uh, walls on the boundary, uh, so people would not be being overlooked upon, but they would be visual dominance for a period until equivalent development occurred. Is that is that how it works? Yes, the, you, you will experience a tall building next door. That's right. Yeah. And so um, the overlooking isn't the problem because people won't build windows and balconies where the next door neighbor is going to... So do the controls control that so that they stop the habitable spaces or the balconies on, on the boundary like that? Or... Um, or is there the a controls that don't do? stop that happening, um, yeah. but in that regard, the um, so a building that we're talking about that sort of scale requires a consent from a from a design perspective, and so then the matters that, that are now introduced in the policies are talking about, you know, explain why um, you're achieving really good privacy between between things. So it doesn't actually say don't do it. Um, it says this is what we want to achieve. How do how do you achieve that? So the assessment then goes into that and says, well, okay, um, in this case, the next door neighbours is this, that, and the other thing. Um, we're going to orientate this because of X, Y, and Z. Um, so, yeah, otherwise you, you're really starting to prescribe down, um, you know, the opportunities perhaps, um, which you might do if, if, if it's a more permissive um, rule, not a restricted discretionary type activity. So with the MDRS type standards, we haven't got any con options for controls over design. So um, arguably you can do that. You can you can overlook your neighbors because as long as you're four meters away and, and you know, you can still you can still achieve that outcome, which is yeah. from my perspective not great. Um, that's that's the that's the framework we're working in. Yeah. Uh, that's that's useful. Um but if you're um you still say those sorts of levels of heights are appropriate in those locations? Yes, yes, and and look, that's a paradigm shift from what we've been used to, and that's that's the biggest thing with the MPSUD about six stories. Um, it's either that we enable it and we embrace that, and we say yes, we're doing six stories, or we're going, well, we're kind of enabling, but you know they're going to be a little bit, you know, further away. Um, so it's yeah, it's it's a different 
So what's honest. wrong with the model of doing what you're suggesting, but also having clear assessment after six stories about all the urban design components to that? We do. That's included. That's how you do the structure. That's the structure of this. That's right. So your question. Because I, I, the standard is 21. What's 21 meters? Is that um, six stories, and then beyond that, you're so your average floor height. Sorry, I'm, I just say I work in a lot of domains. <laughs> I'm getting back to the numbers of housing units, but what is it? Three point seven per floor, or yeah. That... So yeah, we we work roughly on a three point six floor to floor. Yeah. Uh, and that gives you the flexibility of a taller ground floor. Um, typically with apartment buildings, there's, there's measures of, of, of dealing with ground floor uh, relationship to the street, yeah. which might be a bit higher. Also um, enabling roof forms rather than just trying to squeeze six into a flat roof roof form. So um, how, how, how um, a lot of people criticize uniformity of design, but I, I think actually uniformity of design can create street character. But how did they compel that in Paris? Was that because it was just master planning or something? Or it's funny we're talking that, that just before we came in actually today, and I think there is a, a an architect. Um, you know, there's there's quite pres 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 prescriptive rules in in France that achieves that. Right. Um, and it's interesting that um, and I and I'll just take you to the um design guides. Actually, there's some quite interesting illustrations in there of of vertical buildings that have the same height, um, but they're all different colours and different. You know, and so yeah, they look yeah. different, but actually the same forms. There. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Mm. Okay. It's when you get a monotonous, you know, whole block that's that's the same architectural response that starts to, you know, reduce the visual interest. That's, that's yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I guess we all come from our own personal experience, but up from my street, um, in Auckland is um a a development by um. Uh, Ockham, which uh, they write produce good product, and it's called the Fame, and it's not yet developed, but it's designed, and it's highly articulated along the length of Great North Road, so it's quite, you know, you get, but it's the fundamental form, but there are articulations within it, and that's what you're describing, isn't it? Hmm. So, so the frame, the the policy, or the the framework around the standards is saying. Here's here's a here's a bulk um, envelope for built form, right? We expect that at least this sort of scale is appropriate here, but it's still got to be designed well, and so that's when we, we talk about you know that facade and how it relates to the street and how it, it promotes walkability, for example, because it's not a, you know what happens along the side of the street is really important in terms of whether people walk there or not. All right. Well, uh, that's that's useful to sort of understand. <laughs> I, I get that what you're describing. All right. So that that's um, two thirty three, and we've done the only done part of the planning topic. <laughs> um, but why don't we? Why don't we? Isn't that a natural point to go to Mr. Cullen? Because we're now sort of talking about why that height and and so forth, and part of that's functional. But part of that's design. Would that be a good point to do that? And how does that fit within our timetable? Right. So why don't we do that? Yeah. So we're all good. Is that all right to you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. So, welcome. Thank you. And um, well, I just think we'll just ask you questions. Um, uh, I guess segueing into a topic we will get into specifically, which is uh, Ōtaki later, um, which I might come back to you on. But um, you mentioned in your expertise that you have expertise in social and cultural components and how they con contribute to urban form. Yes. Um, 
contextually, um, we we are confronting a situation where the council is saying um, Otaki Town Centre does warrant intensification and um, it's got the precinct B and, and, and the town centre zone itself. Um, Tangata Whenua through Nā uh, o, Hapu o, o, Otaki are saying, don't mind the MDRS, but we're a bit worried about that level of change in our context. And then you're saying, well, actually, it needs to be higher. <laughs> and I'm conscious that that you're um, got a social cultural. I suppose this is not only to you, but uh, Kainga Ora have a specific uh, responsibility to address the treaty and Maori community and interests. And my question is, um, given your experience and expertise, I'll, I'll be asking this, but I take you. This is just to warn you. Hmm. How how you how you reconcile? How does Kainga Ora? How how well has it informed itself about the views of Tangata Whenua, and how do we reconcile these issues? Um, and I'll give you a little warning shot across the bow that you can completely rebut. It seems to me that you've had a very big job on your hands with tier one authorities addressing all of those. And that could lend to a template strategy. But I'm not dealing with a template people. Uh, and I've got a distinctive community here that uh, is strongly got a tongue at the whenua flavor that we need to respond to. So they'll be interested in having that discussion when we get to Ōtaki. <laughs> Not speaking specifically about um, the rail side component, but I am talking about this component and the fact that we're sitting in this marae and the town's formed around the marae, not the other way around. It has a very strong ancestral flavour. Uh, so I'll be interested in that. But in terms of your evidence, um, the theory seems to be, well, are we getting the numbers right in terms of anticipated housing achievement? And then that's the the, 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 the principal case for that. And, and my question is, well, to what extent does the future urban zone, but like future urban zoning, which is a broader exercise, the council is also going to undertake to implement MPSUD still up in the air and and need to be considered um <clears throat> so if if i'm reading um the analysis done by council and its consultants correctly we haven't actually got to that point um for the i guess the um methodology outlined in the mpsud which is to go from enablement as a consequence of the plan change um through to feasible development, which is to say that um, we <clears throat> the plan enables this in terms of um, the kinds of densities and height and things that you've been talking about. Um, that's enabled. And if all of that is developed, this is our capacity. And then it goes to the next tier down, uh, tier is the wrong word, the next sequence down, which is feasible. And it looks at the land constraints, the cost constraints, in fact, it looks at 30 years of those and projects those for now, which is one of the risks that we have. This is quasi science. This is not, and I'm 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 not saying I'm right, and I'm not saying that 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 you know my numbers are right or that the council's numbers are wrong. All I'm saying is we don't know. So then we drop down to feasible, and feasible basically says, um, given the conditions of today, um, we think these sites within the enabled capacity can feasibly be developed. But the next uh, sequence down is realizable, which recognizes that um, when the, within the NPSUD, um, that not everybody who has a site that's feasible to, to develop will come into the market and it will be developed. So that's the next, the next level down. <clears throat> My understanding from what council has done so far is it's gone to the realizable point, but it hasn't dropped down universally within the zones for us to be able to say, um, the realizable capacity within the whole of the local government area is X, 
and that compares with our growth projections, it's either above or below. Um, I don't think we've got to that point yet. And even if we did, even if we were um, above the line in terms of what we have to provide for growth, we still have objective two to look at, which is to say that, well, we need to look at affordability. If we're just meeting growth, does that reduce um, the entry price for, 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 for dwellings to, uh, for people who want to buy here? And the third, the third and fourth aspect of that to me is there appears to be um, a housing crisis is probably a strong word across Wellington when you look at all the um, various housing strategies that the, the councils put out, which indicates there's a latent demand for product that's not yet on the market. And, and are we looking at that as well? So, so I don't have the answers for that in terms of referring to, to council's work. Um, and, and, and I guess um, the other point of it is that you're operating, um, well, every council in New Zealand is going through this process at the moment, mm. where every particular local government area is going to increase its um, capacity for medium and high density development. What is the market in terms of developer market for that kind of response universally across New Zealand? And my answer to that would be, when I look at it, it's quite a small market. Um, and so, uh, and, and some of the big players like Willis Bond, for instance, I think somebody talk, talked about them before, <coughs> um, operate across the country. How many, of, how many Willis Bonds are there out there and how many of second tier operators are, are out there given the opportunities and the competitive opportunities they have to go anywhere in New Zealand and switch things on in accordance with the NPS you do. Um, so they're my sort of concerns. And coming back to Otaki, um, Otaki worries me, um, putting the cultural thing aside for a moment, just in terms of feasibility, it seems to be the least feasible place for anything at density, according to the work that council's done in relation to feasible and realizable. Um, yet there seems to be, according to council's work, a whole lot of demand for additional um, accommodation, dwelling accommodation here. And and maybe cutting you off at the pass, although I may not answer this correctly in terms of, of what you're seeking from me, um, if there is a cultural overlay in relation to this part of Otaki, um, clearly that needs to be recognized. But the other thing in, in some way, and if that relates to density and height, that's an issue that, that you need to deal with directly. Um, but what I would say um, in relation to it now, is this as good as it gets? And, and is there a way forward that incorporates the cultural sensitivity of what sits here around us at the moment um, to improve and I guess potentially layer the kind of development that we would, we would like to see going forward? And that, does that help us with as well with the yield story? Yeah. Well, it's a conundrum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, it's not a direct answer. It's just, it, it's, it's a difficult. So, so what, what was the reason, going back to this Ortaki thing, what's the reason for realizable potential being low here? Is that because the, the, cost, the cost of building relative to price achievements unattractive? That's my understanding. Yes. Yeah. Um, despite the fact that this particular part of the world has the has a lower average cost than the rest of Kapiti. Right. Which I find, which I understand. So I would find the feasibility story a little a little odd, given that the demand appears to be quite high. And and I think I may have said in my evidence that um, that requires organisations like Kanga Aura to come in and unlock, if you like, a catalyst development that shows and demonstrates to the market. How these things can be done well. Yeah, well, and it's it. Yeah, I mean, in decile terms, it's 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 um, lower than other parts of the Kapiti Coast, and there are historical reasons for that, um, all sorts of reasons for that. Um, but um, there are real attempts by Tangata Fenua to 
enable their community to to grow and to flourish um and housing will be a piece piece of that puzzle no doubt um and, and, and there's opportunities obviously to partner with kangapura yeah for that kind of mutually agreeable outcome yeah um uh, part of it might be a sense uh, we have to hear from and uh, Hapua or Otaki, but um, a lot of uh, uh, it, that sort of partnership model probably would attract them because it seems like a lot of these things, when they are imposed on them, they feel that takes away their agency. Um, and um, when they have agency, which is the one anger is a great example of that, and it evolves and develops, it leads to a sort of flourishing because you can see it happening yeah yeah I, I mean the disenfranchised uh or you know taking away <laughs> i think that's possibly universal with the npsud everywhere um I, I think mr banks referred to it in his assessment that you know council had gone through a consultation process um and the consult pro consultation process was two to one not in favor of intensification um, and so I understand, if you like, the council position where to go politically, to go beyond what is the minimum requirement of the NPSUD is poli a very politically difficult thing to, to, to take on. And so I think it's incumbent on agencies such as Kangabora to say, well, um, if, if we go higher and enable more, then we're able to find or give greater capacity for the developers to find the sweet spot. Because we're talking um, uh, within that, it may be six stories, it may be eight stories, it may be 10 stories, it may be less. Um, but if you en enable more, it's not to say that more is going to happen. It's just you've got a wider spectrum to find the sweet spot. And your um, geotech issues here to do with sand and, and to do with um, when you start to get into height, there's quite a lot of cost embedded in just getting the site sorted. To take to height to take height and density, and so amortize, amortizing the cost of that across a greater development capacity is an important part of the considerations. And I know, <clears throat> I mean, property economics becomes done basic work, um, trying to go through the filters of, of of this. But we've got to remember that we're we're taking or assuming thirty years of cost changes, thirty years of feasibility changes. 30 years of, of growth um, and we're trying to snapshot that in time today so what i'm saying is over the next 30 years things will change and let's give us some capacity to be adaptable adaptable and you may in a planning sense put a different threshold on that um, in terms of your entry criteria um, but at least at least give the market some capacity to be a little bit more capable and sorry I that spoke. that that's right the partic that particular argument strikes me as quite strong in relation to um the locations that near rapid transport or metropolitan zone um do you know what i mean that it, yes it, uh, it's more applicable there, it's more right? applicable there yeah. because um people can sell the idea of accessibility and uh, apartment living, which doesn't require so much commitment to vehicles and so forth. I, think I, I just think that going from four to six here in Otaki is is not really, we're arguing about something that's not going to happen anyway. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it does strike me as an area that's got a huge potential uh, because it's actually a very pretty place and it has a lot of um, things going for it that 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 one's people yeah yes I, I, for me coming from outside and looking as so i live in australia um but i'm a kiwi i haven't had the operation yet i've still got the passport in the <laughs> in the bag um so so for me, looking at Otaki Beach, for instance, um, it is possibly the least attractive 
speech as we march our way in terms of um, the response from the built environment it's 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 not as high quality um, and and for me um, I think there's a public realm story to get that up you've got Norfolk pines a lot and parts of it and to start marching those along maybe a boardwalk across the dunes it's it's fully in the land to, to start the I guess to get the public realm to a state where people are going, hey, this is a much underappreciated asset. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would be difficult to start here, um, putting height aside. Uh, um, I don't see necessarily the catalyst that would switch this place on. I think there's a few years before you're going to get rapid rail, a rapid transit to um, Otaki Station. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I I do see this as as difficult anyway. Um, but but for me, I'd be starting to tart up the beach and and get that as a a bit of an inspirer. I don't know what the cultural issues are down there, but um, they may be a factor. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it's it it um that that's certainly true. Um, and those who know the beach would regard it as the best in the capital <laughs> yeah. case but i'm not going there yeah i'm i'm looking at it from different eyes yeah yeah um now that's that's helpful um you described in your evidence you grab the mic if you want to at any point but um i'll just finish this <laughs> um you described the paraparamu town center as not having a lot of attraction for development can you just elaborate on that yeah and then because you just you, you talked about where you thought it that could can i just like to to understand that and and i'll um i'm not i do want to answer that question but i'm going to hand the mic over to james <laughs> talking, talking party. Uh, <laughs> commissioner did you want to say something before i answer well, it was just on the six the six story so the council have gone through the exercise as their permitted to by the MPSUD to look at the heights that are commensurate with the level of commercial activity and they've assessed that four stories is appropriate. They've said Otaki is a town centre and that four stories is appropriate and you're saying um, Otaki is the least feasible, uh, you know, it's, it's least likely to be have development occur. So, and you, you, but you still say, well, we'll go, you should go to six stories. Yeah. So, and, and, and I've listened to the discussion, of course, but why, why, you know, it's just, what's that based on, yeah. given there has been some assessment done about what they consider is to be the appropriate height, um, and you come along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so there's two questions there, I might deal yeah, with yours yeah. first. Um, so, I, I mean, mine is more of a, a global consideration, worrying about your ability to achieve, to achieve dwelling capacity in relation to your growth forecasts. And so I'm sort of looking across the region and saying, well, where can we do that? And are we consistent with um, a region-wide assessment of, of town centres, for instance, where we're arguing for the same sort of thing? You've introduced a cultural uh, requirement to this, which will modify, obviously, that view. I haven't considered that. It's, it's more of a global um, capacity concern. Um, and so, you know, for cultural reasons, if four stories is, um, and I don't understand why that would be the case, but but if it is the case, then obviously that's something that that needs to be considered. The the other thing is, it's not my evidence necessarily that says that Otaki is the least feasible. It's something that that the council has, um, yes. and and I don't understand that. Um, I can understand it just looking at it. It seems to have gone to sleep, which might for a number of years, which might be a good thing in, in a sense. Um, but you've got a number of amenities and assets uh, here that are, I would have thought, supportive of the kind of amenities that you want as a, re as a future resident to be close to and, and to have access to. Um, the other thing in relation to, uh, does, that, does that help you, Commissioner? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that you, we were talking about Otaki. Yes. But there are other places as well where Kaingor has done the same thing and the same applies. They won't necessarily be culture, but I'll talk about character later on. Yes. But um, that, that, that's the same applies, that, that without this culture, without the cultural consideration necessarily, yes. but there might be something else. Yes. And that Kaingor have just said, well, we think you should go to six stories or 10 in the case of Metropolitan Centre Zone. Um, yeah, so there's a consistency argument 
across the region? Well, that's what, I've, that's what that? I'm hearing, is that, that yeah. Wellington's very different from Kapiti. It is. It is. Um, but it's the same with, I guess, with Porua and Lower Hutt and Upper Hutt. Mm. Um, we're we're going, th going through the same sort of assessments that, that under the NPSUD, you're obliged to follow a certain path. And, and we're, I guess we're sort of saying that's the minimum. We'd like to see more. That's right. But council is given the discretion to make choices it, around it is. centres. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm not taking it away from you. Yeah. Yep. 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 In relation to Parapa Umu, which is, um, <coughs> I have serious concerns. Sorry, I'll, I'll take a step back. Um, in relation to intensification and density, um, there are two, at least two elements putting aside rail transit for a moment in relation to centres. Um, the two elements are amenity and amenities. Amenities being the resources that are available to you within a walking distance. Um, those available, those resources available in Parapara Umu um, on the east side of Rimu Road are uh, uh, urban difficult, if you like. So the amenity isn't there in terms of the things that would switch on the demand for density in apartments. You've got um, relatively ugly buildings that address car parks set back from the street. Um, and so, and you've got an internalized mall that takes all the activity off the street. And so your urban story is low pedestrian activity, car dominated, um, hard stands of, of car parks, the kinds of things that we worried about in terms of the urban environment. Um, and there's not enough urban amenity, street life, foot traffic in the public realm to switch on the amenity that people regard as a switch to intensify and diversify. And so I can't see in the early stages of intensification, everything east of Rimu Road intensifying. I just think the, um, the switches just aren't there. Um, uh, because you're asking the owners of those sites to either sacrifice their car parking or demolish and redevelop. And, and I just can't see the market factors at this point available for that kind of conversion to occur. West of Rimu Road, where council is and beyond council, and to the, to the motorway, I think, yes, there is an opportunity to do a structure plan, an urban, I've had a go at one, um, Already, I think you may have, may have seen that um, in terms of how we can change and, and create an urban setting uh, for urban retail and urban diversity and high density urban living. Now, in the medium to long term, the consequences of that may change the way that the market and the owners of coastlands and that sort of area see their opportunity. But I can't see for the life of me why they would change now. You need something else to do it. Did did that answer your question, Commissioner? Yeah. Some of your observations. Damn, only some. Yeah. Uh, well, um, we had a very interesting presentation from um, Waikanae Eastland Company, which talked about um, intensifying uh, on Waikanae East, and Frank Boffer, who you may be aware of. Um, did a structure plan, <laughs> uh, which would be optimistic for us to implement in this process, but it did actually have a similar concept of, of utilizing proximity to rapid transport and creating spaces that would really drive intensification uh, around those locations, which I think, um, I guess if, if I was uh, thinking of the biggest wins that you could make for urban functioning in Kapiti Coast, it would be around those rapid transit stops and so forth, and creating an urban environment. Yeah, um, and I, I have some doubt about the realization of from brownfields residential to uh, townhouses, yeah. um, and not just because you're building on sand. Yeah. You you've also got I think. The capacity along the beach is already demonstrated. Um, it's more a uh, you know proximity to beach uh, views, um, and with Kyanga Aura's proposition that you can put 200 
square meters of commercial retail on the ground floor that gives you the capacity to be a little bit more self-contained and a little less in an isolated residential only enclave. Um, you've got some street possibility of street life as a consequence of, of those sorts of things. So based on, on your experience, um, when a developer comes along and says, okay, this is the site I've got, look at the district plan, um, are they going to the lowest common denominator the plan sets or are they tending to say, well, we'll, we'll venture into something different by going for a consenting process to develop something which is much more desirable but and innovative? Do you know what I mean? Like, or is that why your settings is, is sort of like enablement preference because your con developers actually don't like consenting processes or what's, what's the... Um, not all developers the same obviously there are some developers that are more um, entrepreneurial and more willing to challenge um, than others um, but I would say that um, the fewer hurdles you put in their way the more chance you have of getting things away I mean that's just a basic basic fact um, but I but I do believe that design quality is a fundamental um, issue um, and you know if we could have Houseman doing his stuff here with um with artists on the top floor of all buildings um and the wealthy people on the ground floor um you know how, how things have changed um and, and and we could have some certainty within the community that the quality of the environment that we were about to live do deliver as a consequence of the npsud was going to be so superb and houseman like we probably wouldn't have a problem and and it's your point before. Can I see um, what this might look like? Uh, I, th I think that's a fundamental issue for mm. me in terms of the quality of the urban environment. We don't want um, standalone apartments with miserly ground floors that turn their way, turn their back on the street. Um, that's the last thing we need. Because mm. because density without design can be a major major problem. problem. Yeah. So you support the idea of design very uh, much assessment. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, I have the privilege of, of being part of a team that designed a new town, an urban town, in fact, the only urban town we've built in Australia since World War I um, in Canberra called Dungarlan. Um, and when we wrote, after we'd designed the town um, around streets, not, not, not a shopping mall, um, we wrote the planning controls. Um, for the town centre, and then after we'd finished that, it took us about three months, after, after we'd finished that, we all said to ourselves, as planners and designers, um, where's an outcome on the ground that we would regard as unacceptable? Let's go and have a look at their planning controls. And we all said Tugranong, for those of you who know Canberra, um, it's another town in Canberra. So we grabbed Tugranong's planning controls and we'd just rewritten them. And at that point, we realised we needed to get into design. Um, and so we wrote, possibly the first urban design control um, for a town centre in Australia if, for Gungahlin. Mm. Because planning controls alone won't give you the outcomes that you seek. So we're well talking about principles and objectives and rules, but uh, we want to know what this looks like and, and what are the things that we don't want to see. And we want to see demonstrations of both in the planning so, controls. So um, there's treatment in both the evidence and the submissions on design guide. Is the criticism not so much that there is a design guide but it tries to do too much is, is that what's the um i haven't looked carefully at that so that's probably not a question for me possibly for mr ray mm, okay all right well um we've gone around the mulberry bush a bit on some things but um it's a bit free forming but i think it's better if we just explore it things with you um so we probably should have a cup of tea and uh, a break, and then we'll come back and continue to freeform. <laughs>
Um, <clears throat> I've been listening quite attentively and interestingly at the conversation that we've had just before afternoon tea. <clears throat> there are a couple of things, observations, I suppose, I would just want to run past us here today because I'm pretty sure they're going to come up tomorrow and you be um, you'd be making their presentations. <clears throat> And I wasn't going to say anything until I thought, well, hang on, it's maybe a good time to actually um, just make one or two observations. <clears throat> and one of them is about this thing we call cultural. <laughs> Sometimes I think of that and I think, well, if cultural is being Māori, what the hell the rest of you have? <laughs> Honestly, it, it, it does seem choose. like that sometimes, you know. It's cultural, so it's Māori. And, and I, I, I rail sometimes often when I kind of hear that. So I think some of the, sometimes these things need to be put in a proper perspective. <clears throat> uh, because I know the iwi from around here would say the same thing. <clears throat> and if we think in terms of I, I suppose the progress we've made in terms of race relations in New Zealand over recent years, things like singing the national anthem in both English and Māori, stuff like that, you know, kia ora and all that sort of stuff becoming just common usage. You know, we don't even think about it now, we just do it. Yeah. So that to me signals though that we've come so far, but we've still got a way to go, but we've been bold enough, I think, to actually take those steps. And we've had to be, you know, whether it was the Māori side of it being bold or the Pākehā side of it being bold, but we've, as a collective, as a country, we've, we've been much bolder about these things, more receptive, more understanding of them. And <clears throat> for me, one of the, the, the key elements of this whole discussion we're having around here is housing. And even in, in in some of the submit, a lot of submissions we've had have been around how housing is a real challenge for Māori. Affordable housing initially. Affordability is one of the key things. And and for Māori, we had a, a presenter yesterday from Pai Kātāriki, and that's what he was saying. He said, I'd love all my Aupi to come back, but we don't have affordable housing. All that sort of stuff. So. And you are the, you know, crying our order. You know? mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it's, I think it's just um, appropriate for that kind of conversation to be had in your midst or around here to hear what they are saying and local people are having to say about, so what does this really mean for us? And, and will this plan change help us to, to, to achieve all the things that we've always wanted to achieve. I think we've gone a long way towards doing that. And I don't know, I'm pretty sure we won't get the answers. We still have the questions. The questions we can do for a long time yet. Uh, but I just, I just wanted to make those two observations because they are important. Um, certainly important in your work. And, and my last comment, <clears throat> it's around the name Kainga Ora. Now we have Waka Kotahi, Kainga Ora. We have a lot of these, these word usages, I guess, in the, in the system at the moment. Yet, and this is not meant to be a criticism, but yet I, I, I think a lot of people would still Change whether even a name change like that has done it for us as a community. You know, have we have we taken all that stuff on board in a way that okay, so we can think as a team. We, we're not two different or three different lots of people. We are a, a single community, but our rhetoric doesn't reflect that that often, or in a way in which we do things. So. Again, it's just something uh, <coughs> a 
just wanted to put on the table as well. And I just wonder whether you had any comments. I mean, Mr. Cullen, you might want to just comment as for somebody who's been out of the country and who's back in here and now you've seen it um, over time. <laughs> um, well, I, I left in the um, mid 80s. Um, and so none of this uh, stuff was pervasive, you know, certainly for a sort of white Scottish Irish descendant lived in Christchurch. Um, and so, <clears throat> so I've seen huge changes um, uh, being away and coming back. Having said that, I've been going for, backwards and forwards for over 30 years. Um, and so, <clears throat> so it, 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 it is interesting. Um, I, th I think, you know, there's an evolution in all of this stuff. It's, it's not sort of, if we can take the elements um, that we understand that are important and convert them into um, uh, uh, new ways of adapting and thinking and, and, you know, one of them, for instance, um, and it's difficult to say, I guess, in this forum is that um, height doesn't necessarily mean density. Uh, for instance, it very much depends on Mr. Ray's sort of discipline in terms of how you um, convert that. I mean, as the commissioner said, you know, Paris is mostly six stories. Um, it's one of the densest cities in the world. Um, and so, you know, there may be the possibility of, of taking the elements that we believe that are important, that we hold on to um, as a culturally diverse community and incorporating Maori um, into an affordability challenge. And I would say that, that yield is a part of that. So if we lose, if we lose height, we may lose um, density. And, we, and, and so in terms of objective two, how do we deal with that? I, I, I sort of find that, that most councils have dealt with objective three in terms of their obligations, but haven't really looked at objective two. So objective two is really an affordability objective. Um, and so how do we take that objective forward, can we do it in the medium density zone, for instance, in terms of affordability? I don't know the answer to that. And it'll vary place to place because you've got qualifying matters and a whole lot of other things to deal with. So um, I'm unable to answer your question in terms of the cultural translation um, of the Otaki story into height and density. I can't answer that. I don't understand that fully and it would be silly of me to have it have a, a, a attempt at that. But I would say that it's clearly an issue and, and I can't give you an answer to it, um, unfortunately. Commissioner, thank you for your comments and observations. I would say that this is um, very very squarely within the, the ambit of what Mr. Singh will discuss with you as being Kainga Oris corporate representative. And that's often why we start our presentations in these cases with um, with that evidence, because uh, it just gives hearing panels a, very much a sense of how seriously Kainga Ora takes its statutory mandate um, and how far that reaches in terms of affordability, but also being conscious of the diverse needs of different communities. So um, I will ask him to address you on that when, when we're finished with Mr. Cullen. Thank you. That's an appropriate time to do that. Kia ora. Kia ora. So would you like me to answer that specific question or do you have? Sure. Yeah. So look, um, Kaying Order is a very new organisation. It is, has embodied Housing New Zealand and HLC and part of KiwiBuild. And, you know, we're still quite young in that sense of what Kaying Order as an organisation is doing and, and uh, how it's branching out into the, the districts and the regions. I think a legacy has been is that Housing New Zealand focusing on public housing or state housing has been primarily focused on cities and urban areas, mainly like your Wellingtons, your Christchurch and Auckland. 
and when the amalgamation happened and the, and the branching of bringing together different groups and entities, you know, it was looking at what are we doing, not just in providing for public housing, but in the urban development space, in the communities, and how do we bring people along the journey of some of the developments that we're doing. Uh, so it's not just about providing public housing, but it's about looking at how does the urban areas function? What are the services? What are the community services? What are the um, spaces, reserves? You know, so in a way, the the functions of Kaingora has expanded and it's broadened its kind of its reach. So it's able to um, not just go and build houses, but help to influence and help others to create communities and be able to do development in those communities so that we're not the only ones who are having to provide housing, that we can support others, including mana whenua, to provide houses, papakainga housing, for their communities and their um, and their people. And the role that we take is, you know, it's one of being a partner, but it's also a helping hand. It's enabling and supporting, uh, not just financially, but through the people and our skill sets to help those communities and those organizations that perhaps don't have um, the money, the resources, to have that helping hand from a government entity that uh, is focused on this area. So it's not just about providing public housing, it's about how do we enable our partners in our communities to be able to flourish and to grow those communities so that they're sustained for a long time. Uh, you know, Kaimura's approach to MPCD and, you know, NDRS and all of these legislations uh, is, is a starting point in the sense of seeing the outcomes that I think the government is trying to see, is, which is having more people in homes, taking people off the streets, out of our hotels and motels, and being able to put them into having a, a safe, dry, warm home, uh, as well as living in the communities that they want to live in, be close to their whanau, have their kids go to school, be part of communities where they can work, live, play. So it's taking more of a broad brush approach. And I think our interest in these plane changes is that is trying to enable outcomes, not just for ourselves, but for others to be able to take as well. And sometimes, yes, Kaingora comes in and makes heavy submissions. Uh, but we do so because we know that there are people out there who perhaps haven't seen what councils are proposing, don't understand what councils are proposing, and perhaps don't even have the funds and resources to get involved in these processes. And so Kaingora comes and says, look, the opportunities we're looking for growth, the opportunities that we're seeing for residential intensification or providing for, it's not just for us. It's enabling those private landowners, those mum and dads, to actually take those opportunities up as well. Because for our perspective, it requires a whole range of people to actually enable the housing opportunities and outcomes to come. We're not going to solve affordable housing, but when we work with other groups and entities and organisations and manafuna organisations as well, we're able to help contribute to that housing need that's seen out there in the communities. Um, yes, we've got a public housing wait list of, uh, you know, of people that are waiting for homes, but there are also people out there who are not listed on that register, who local community social housing providers in, you know, in local iwi will know families who are not on that wait list and are wanting a home, but have chosen not to be on that. And, and you know, and there's a need for them to, find a place to go and so our role is going well beyond just us doing what we're doing um is being able to partner and support those organizations around us to be able to support that need as well uh i think there was a point made earlier around um the relationship of carpety and wellington city and the response to plan changes and kind order submission we don't look at um Carpety and Wellington being separate, we look at it as a collective because when we're looking at development opportunities, we're looking at where can we be able to get the houses built that would support the need uh, in regions across. So there is a need to provide housing in Carpety, in Otaki, uh, in Paraparaumu. Same as the need to provide for houses in Porirua and Wellington City. 
when it comes to development, what we do is we look at it and go, what is the flame? What's the framework that is allowing us to do that? What is the framework enabling us to build? And unfortunately, in the current situation, Kapiti District's plans don't enable us to build, don't even allow us to get through a consenting process to build homes. And if that's our first barrier, then we're sitting going, we're not going to change the wait list. We're not going to help get people into homes because our first obstacle is the district plan. It's not whether we can do the development or whether it's feasible. Our first reaction is the plan doesn't enable us to build houses or build the type of houses that our the wait list or the people that are waiting for a home to have in that community. And so, you know, I myself um, have been with Kaying Order for about nearly five years. And I started off looking at um, opportunities for where we could build houses across um, outside of Auckland. And what I found was that a lot of the districts, potentially like Pakapati, Western Bays, you know, smaller councils that are close by to major cities, their district plans don't enable the outcomes that the communities and the people in that community want um, to be had. And that's where we kind of start with, because we look at the plans and we go, well, how can we enable to build, you know, um, a two bedroom house or a, you know, one bedroom walk up, which is a three level um, apart, um, terrace walk ups. Uh, when, and what we do is we look at the district plans and we go, well, to do this, it's going to take us, uh, it's going to take us through a resource consent. It's going to take us potentially to a notified consent. You know, we've got a public housing plan to build 800 new homes, additional new homes in the Wellington region. And that's over a four year period. And when we start to look at that, we go, well, if we can't do it in Kapiti, we then have to go and look at Porirua or we look at Hutt City. And that takes away the desire to build a house in Kapiti and to try and help the people that are waiting for a house in Kapiti to live in Kapiti because we're having to go, well, we can't do it here. So we're going to have to build in Porirua or Hutt. And the same questions come up there as well. And what we're trying to do through our submissions and, and uh, the changes that we're looking for is to take away that question, to take away the question and the challenge that why should we um, be questioning if we could build a house in Kapiti? We should be allowed to build a house in Kapiti. We should be allowed to go ahead and look at some of the development opportunities that we want and go, you know, looking at Kapiti, we want to build houses here close to the centers and services. We want um, homes to be built close to the public transport, you know, to get on the Otaki train to get into Wellington City. We want that for our, not just our tenants, but for anyone to have that ability to do. Um, but if we're not able to build a house or get that opportunity realizable, then we walk away from going, well, we can't actually develop here. We have to go look somewhere else. And so, you know, it's not just a, <laughs> come in and look for as much intensification and housing is the only thing we're looking for. It's, it's not at all that for us. It's about, you know, what is the community providing for those people that are living there? Um, you know, when I look at Otaki, I'm thinking there are people who probably want to come back to Otaki and live close to their whanau, close to their marae, that don't have those opportunities available, don't see the housing opportunities, don't see the housing need that's going to provide for them. The demand a lot of the time in the applicants and the wait list is one to two bedrooms, but we've also got larger homes that families demand, the six plus, uh, the five plus bedrooms. So when we look at these provisions, it's about enabling not just for intensification, but also how you can provide the space for large homes to be built. So I think, you know, when we come in and look at these rules, we're kind of going, if you take away the question of um, not enabling, but enabling it, then opportunities, uh, you know, they they just in, increase for us. So I think I've rattled on too much now. But hopefully that gives you a bit of context to, you know, why. I mean, I'm quite passionate because I, I've, I've seen projects. We've got um, about 120 houses planned to build in Carpeti in the next two to three years. They're all sitting at planning stage. Uh, and the reason why they're saying planning stage is because the current framework of the district plan doesn't enable us 
to do them right now. And my message as a planner to our construction team is let's just wait for the district plan change to happen because the opportunities will become so realizable that instead of going for 120, we could go for more. And that's what we should be aiming for. And that 120 isn't just for us to build public housing, but it also raises a question around how can we enable affordable housing to be made? How can we partner with other developers uh, in Wellington region to be able to go, you know, let's support your initiative to build houses, but provide it at an affordable rate. Kaing Order is doing that in the Auckland context. Kaing Order is doing that in some of the regions like Rotorua. And so, you know, we ask the same thing here that we would like to see that in Kapiti, we'd like to see that in Wellington. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, we firstly have to change the planning framework. Like it's not, it is now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so where, where are mostly your properties in Kapiti? Uh, Kapiti, we've got a bunch of Notaki and uh, Parabama Umu. So between those two is our main centres. So we've been looking at a lot of projects in Otaki um, and we've counted a lot of consenting hurdles. So we've always had to kind of um, not say put them on the back burner, but we've, they're still there. We just haven't progressed them further because we're waiting for this to happen, this plan change. What sort of, um, what is the type of demand in Otaki? One to two bedrooms. Yeah, often it's for um, single, uh, like single parent families who've got children or for single adults who are looking for a home. And then the other side is the very large families. Generally about 70, I think I've written here about 89% of the wait list for Kapiti is one or two bedrooms. I am familiar with the Eastern Porirua project because I do do work on that. Are you, so are these, when you do one to two stories in buildings, they're usually walk-ups? Uh, one, one to two bedrooms can be a form of uh, single detached, detach, um, sorry, single detached duplexes or walk-ups. Ideally, walk-ups at a three level will give you about nine to 12 uh, units. Um, dwelling numbers or you could do which we've done many times as you do three one bedroom on a site or you know five one bedrooms so we would still um, it, it depends on what the rules are and what the site layout is but we've got a range of typologies that would enable those outcomes yeah so the proposed provisions will enable you to do um six stories in some areas and, and four in others and that would meet demand that's obviously going to improve it, well, it, will, it will definitely assist in demand generally speaking we don't do four story developments so when the council the plan has proposed four we find that four doesn't work from a feasibility perspective because you have to add lifts into a building and then feasibility runs happens that you go well, if you're adding a lift and you might as well look at providing a five-story development or a six-story development. And so generally for a three-level or three stories, we would do a walk-up. So it's basically stairs that you can walk up to. Uh, but then when you're counting, if we're proposing a development for elderly or for families that have got certain accessibility, then we would consider putting lifts in. But then it's starting to question what type of development is it and the typology in the location of it. Often we would want to do apartments and walk-ups very close to services and amenities. So it's that people have access to public transports because vehicles is uh, an asset to a lot of our tenants, but most of our tenants also don't have vehicles. And so then we look at, well, if we were providing a three-level walk-up, we would be thinking about people who don't have vehicles that could live there close to a public transport, um, a supermarket they can walk to. If they've got kids, they can take it to school. So it, the six levels enables us to provide for a variety of housing uh, at five stories or six. But it also even enables us for some of the sites to provide three to five 
level developments. So generally speaking, it doesn't always have to be a six level apartment or a five level apartment. Some of the sites in the work that we're doing is exploring the relationship of the site with neighboring properties, because we acknowledge that, you know, this is quite brand new for the community. And often when we are in, excuse me, when we are coming into like Kapiti district, you know, we want the community to come along the journey and see some of the developments we do. So they get a good feel of the quality of the form and the outcomes we're building. Uh, and recently in Gisborne, we did a three-story development. It was really important for us to bring the community along and for not just our customers and tenants, but the community to see the kind of development that Kind Water can do. So it doesn't feel like it's um, out of place or seem to be, uh, Sometimes people use different words for describing our um, built forms in our communities and the customers, but be able to see that we can build really good developments um, that will provide for the need. Yes, I've seen um, familiar with Rolleston and Arlington and Wellington as well. Yes. By Redcon and they're, they're, they're very good urban model. Yes. Um, yeah, it's more that would suits Wellington, perhaps not so much here. So, if 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 with your current um, backlog with um, through the planning regulations, would would the current would what's proposed clear your way through what you're proposing, or would you be looking to do more? Uh, the I think <laughs> the notified plan change, as with its provisions, will not it won't help the full picture. It won't help to go the way that we're going at the moment. What we've proposed, along with some of the changes how experts have given, it will enable the outcomes that we're looking for. And it won't just enable what we're doing. I think it will enable others to do things that doesn't put just the, the heavy burden on Kaying or Order to do more. Uh, it will enable us to partner with other organizations to say, look, these are the outcomes of the plan that um, Carpeti has proposed. Uh, let's work together to provide additional housing that won't just take the burden or the, the heavy lifting out from kind order, but it would help share that with others so that um, you know we can find local manafino groups and developers being able to provide for housing um, that the community needs or there's a demand or need out there. Thank you. That's, I don't have any questions, I understand what you're saying. So, um, how do you want to proceed? We've lost our track. <laughs> um, I think you might have had some more questions for Mr. Cullen. I can get him back. Um, and then otherwise, I'd really like you to hear from Mr. Ray, because um, there's a couple of things I think he'd like to draw your attention to. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. Mr. Ray first, and then we'll come back to you, Mr. Cullen. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come back. <laughs> um, look, I, I think, um, and I've made some speaking notes here that I just wanted to cover off perhaps first. And, and um, uh, I think Kapiti is an amazing place that has a great opportunity. I think it's it's had um, a, a bit of a a bit of a hard life in the last little while, particularly with the infrastructure changes and the motorways and things being made. Um, but it actually provides a really good opportunity, um, and particularly when you start thinking about you know the main centres and and um, the walkability issues that the that the um, state highway network actually created in places like Waikanae. And when you look at that, there's like one pedestrian crossing at the lights, you know, to get across the street um, to the train station, for example. You know, so these things need. If, if we're really talking about creating an urban place for people to live, which this opportunity really creates then there's public realm improvement that needs to happen yeah. uh, along with the changes and development around it okay so that that's that's the first thing and um so what is that opportunity um and how should that manifest going forward um and uh i actually provided some evidence 
prior to the Auckland Unitary Plan around King Seat in, in um, South Auckland, if you know that area, um, where um, it's, a, it's a small, um, it was actually a, a, a mental institution hospital uh, some years ago. Um, so uh, they were talking about what is that, what is that new town going to be, and they're providing pretty much a low density rural residential outcome there. And I said, well, why, why not something else? Why not? Because there's one, one primary school there. And I said, well, what about the secondary schools? Where are they? Why not actually put two primary schools and a secondary school here and put a population here that actually makes sense? And I actually referred to San Gimiano in Italy, which is up on a hill in a rural environment, <laughs> which is a completely different outcome, right? And I said, you're all going to laugh, and you did. <laughs> um, I haven't been there, I have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and people flock there because they love going to that space um, for whatever reason. And, and it's, not an, it's not an attraction that you go necessarily, you go there because of the place. Um, so when you think about the Kapiti opportunity, what is that going forward? And um, you're required to basically give um, three stories, three units on a site as of right. So um, through all of this place, it's going to change. And is that appropriate here, wherever? Um, we don't know. It's been enforced on us. Um, and I'll say that it's probably a little bit too broad, <laughs> right? Um, particularly because there isn't a lot of control around how that interfaces with the public now. There's, there's some around windows and setbacks and things like that, but fundamentally, we need to make sure that the place is interesting, it's active, um, and it's safe. So if it's three stories, is that the right answer? Is four stories the right answer? Is six stories, 10 stories, what is the right answer? And I think if you're going to rebuild a place, because a lot of this about what we're talking about is brownfield redevelopment um, in and around centers. And if you're going to redevelop that, what should that be? What's the best use of that land going forward? So if you're gonna do three, why not four? What's the issues with four? What's the issues with five? What's the issues with six? So I put it to you that um, the, the submissions that are made by Crown will actually challenge that um, position and say, how do we define, you know, and, and unfortunately we kind of uh, are directed by the NPS, um, which is a good thing and a bad thing, I think, because it really has opened up the, the opportunity for places like the Kapiti area to go, oh, it's not just um, it's not just business as usual. It's what should be here. And if you look at Parapara Umi, for example, um, that centre has got a lot of land around it, which could be quite um, uh, utilised and developed. Again, should that be limited to six, to ten, to twelve? What's the issues with that? Should we get some more people living there? And my my view is when I when I have travelled around the Wellington region, um, particularly particularly the Johnstonville um, Porirua kind of um, connection, there isn't a lot of opportunity for residential development near centres. If you think about Porirua Centre, it's very limited in terms of the connections of residential next to it. So you've actually got to intensify the centre, and we're talking about zones, but you're actually talking about a place, and it happens to have zones that control things because we need to. So my view is that you really need to enable as much in the centre. Um, I just heard the um, um, the chair of the business association um, um, in Tauranga on the radio yesterday saying we need more people living in the centre. It's dead. It's dying. We can't keep doing this. So um, so look, that, that's kind of the the background from where I've been thinking about this and. And it challenges um, places like Otaki. It's like, oh, really? We're going to have six stories in Otaki? This, 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 not, you know, not on my radar, you know. But, um, and it might not happen for 10, 20, or 30 years. But I think there is an opportunity there to say, well, if you're going to develop a property, what should that be? Because it's going to be there for 50 or 100 years. Right? And if, if you're thinking about Otaki Rail, context, that's probably, you know, I say probably, I don't know exactly, but there is a plan to potentially put that into um, 
a, a, a rapid transit service in the future. So what do you enable now? And, and the, two, the two need to work together. So community, cultural, um, uh, commercial activity with residential needs to all work together so that you can't just have, you know, you can't just build a centre and then no one living there, it's not going to work. So it's a real, it's a real challenge. <laughs> um, so, um, so, so basically, um, um, in terms of that planned urban outcome uh, form, um, we've, we've been looking at, at and, and hence the reason why Miss Williams was talking about a different zone, because it's a different place, it's a different expectation. Um, and so there's kind of two options here, one council's proposition and, and one we've put forward as an option. There's probably many others as well, um, but that's what's before you now. Um, and so rather than saying, look, oh, we're, we're just going to kind of um, enable it, but um, we'll only enable it on the few sites where people can actually amalgamate enough land to do that, um, let's actually enable it. Um, and I've had pers personal experience where I've actually tried to enable uh, or amalgamate three sites in, in the urban zone in Auckland, but the guy in the middle didn't want to sell. So completely kills the opportunity. So the, the, the smaller the number of sites that you need to amalgamate to actually achieve a six story outcome or density, because ultimately the height in relation to boundary is, is the biggest um, hurdle in terms of creating height um, or density. Um, so the smaller the number of units or land holdings that you need to buy to achieve that, the easier it is for more people to do that. Right? And, and I'll, that's, that, there's another feasibility access around that. But if you can imagine, if I only have to buy one site to do some development, um, then it's a lot easier than buying three. Um, and, and it'll depend on the, 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 the nature and, and scale of the developer who does that. Um, so, um, and as I was saying before, the height in relation to boundary is, is quite a key aspect. We can talk about height until the cows come home, but if you've only got a small site, you're not going to get to six storeys, right? Um, or you're going to try and push six storeys with a non-compliance of the height in relation to boundary. And then you get into the arguments around shade and dominance. Right, right, right. So what we're trying to do here is actually put an expectation as to what is expected uh, with a form and a, and a building envelope. Uh, and, and recognize that, that design is very important in that regard. So it's not just you can go and do six stories and, you know, happy days. Um, but from my experience, the developers actually want some certainty of outcome. So they know that they're quite happy to go through a resource consent process because um, it's expected, but they want to know what they need to achieve to do that. So if they can, off, you know, in, in their initial kind of... Um, um, the feasibility studies say, um, yes, I can get to six stories, I can get X amount of units on the site, yes, it makes it feasible, I can go ahead and spend a whole lot of money designing it, then they're more likely to, to move forward with some confidence. So, and that's, that's yeah, that's what I found. Um, so, um, look, um, and look, what I, what I tried to do in, um, in, my, in my evidence and, and attachments is, is trying to explain some of that. Um, and, and I'll just, if I can turn you to attachment um, D, um, which is um, these series of images. <coughs> um, what we've tried to do there is just illustrate the, the basic bulk and form um, principles or the standards that were proposed by the council and, and, and by Kaiangora. Um, and, and so the first one is effectively MDRS um, outcome. The second one is um, with some more height. So it's the same height in relation to boundary. Um, now, um, and I forget if I put it in this evidence, but <laughs> um, I've done a number of them. Um, if you can imagine that um, that's an outcome where built form is on individual sites. And so that these sites are about 500 square meters, roughly. Um, and that, that's an outcome that could happen. And, and um, but the, the alternative is that um, these are actually amalgamated and the, the height's actually taller than this. And so you actually get a, a quite a big building bulk, um, not too dissimilar to what we're proposing in, um, in the last one. The question then becomes, should there be a recession plane 
they had an interface and we talked about that um, wall on, on a boundary um, previously. Um, and so when I went through the analysis of, of that, um, but, and it started in Porirua actually, and they, they didn't have a, a building coverage standard in, in Porirua. And um, it ended up being um, quite a significant bulk on the, on the, on the land. Uh, they have a 20% landscape requirement, um, which on a 500 square meter site is basically, if you do the yards, you kind of achieve it, right? Doesn't really give you much um, landscape um, contribution. Uh, so, and that's where we found that actually, if you recommend and include a, a building coverage standard, a 50%, and, and that might be arguable. Um, I'm not saying that's an exact figure, but um, certainly one that's been used uh, in, in other um, regions. Uh, then you've got the opportunity to um, provide open space as well as built form. And remember, this is a residential place. It's not a centre, and the centre is not expecting that sort of outcome. They're, you know, it's mainly buildings and relying on the, the, the landscape within the street, the public realm to, to provide for that. Um, so, it, and it doesn't stop, you know, a, a, a fairly, um, you know, blank wall of backs of properties down a, down a, down a you know, a long development, um, which is actually enabled by the MDRS, unfortunately. Um, uh, and, and, and what, from an urban design perspective, what I'd try and like to, to achieve is actually um, enable people so, so that particularly the outlook spaces and the, the open spaces, the private spaces can be designed that they're not looking over the neighbours. And I've got an example we've just done in Auckland where um, the, the, the standards are actually enabling that to happen. Um, and you're trying to rely on trees and things to help with privacy. So, um, uh, and, and the number of diagrams in there around um, showing the different shading aspects of that. Um, and I've acknowledged that um, potentially building to the height in relation to boundaries that's proposed by Kaingaroa uh, increases shadow, um, but uh, it still enables shadow uh, sun to, to good parts of the property um, throughout the day. Uh, and, it, and it may be that you have sun in the morning, you don't have it in the afternoon, depending on where your apartment um, uh, was focused. Um, and then um, a number of diagrams just to illustrate um, how height in relation to boundary works. And we actually started looking at, well, what's the minimum width of a site that you would need to actually get to six stories? And that was kind of the exercise. It's not that we're, we're necessarily trying to create a pyramid with, with a bedroom at top. <laughs> um, but but if you can think about, um, you know, if you are going to do a six-story building, it's probably, um, uh, yeah, um, as I said before, you, you end up with a yard or a podium-type development of, of, say, three stories and then, a, and then a taller six, which is set back. Um, and that has other implications and cost and, and water tightness issues. Um, so um, that's that. And... Um, I might just turn quickly to um, the maps that are in attachment um, um, attachment E of my evidence. Um, and I think um, what yeah what, what we've tried to do is is um, obviously uh, relate um, Miss Williams' evidence to the plan. So the zoning in here is relative to that. Um, we've tried to illustrate where um, the precincts that were proposed by council um, uh, were included. Um, um, and, and for example, on, on map three um, at Raumati, if, I, if you can see that, um, uh, there's an area there where, um, and I might just hold it up and point, um, we've got a pink, pink line. So that is um, the precinct. Uh, so this is, yeah, Ramadi Town, page three. Um, so that's that's where um, precinct B was um, proposed by council um, uh, for the 14, 14 meters, just 14 meters. Um, and then also um, just next to it in the purple is um, precinct A. Um, and this. 
if I can just talk about this area, it's it's a bit problematic from my perspective because of the issue of the um, motorway running through the middle of this area. Um, Precinct A was, um, as I understand it, promoted because it's within a walkable catchment of the Metropolitan Centre. Um, and really it, it kind of, the, the main the main connections are gonna be, you know, under the motorway or along Kapiti Road. Um, this area in here is not particularly well connected in that regard, um, and, and nor is this. So this side actually relates more to Raumaki now because of the, because of the motorway, you know. Um, and look, depends on what happens within the um, the metropolitan zone, which is effectively greenfield at the moment, um, and and it could provide quite good opportunities for walkability and depending on you know what how much is open space and and and, and development in there. Um, and so look, in my evidence, I've actually got two options for you, and 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 it depends on how how you think, uh, um, and how we should be applying the. Um, the walkable catchment in this area, because if it makes sense to intensify along the motorway, and it makes sense to intensify around the centre, which is next to the beach, which has a high amenity value for apartment building and, and higher density, even though it's a relatively small centre, what's in between? And there wasn't a lot. Of, and so in my plans here, we're showing a wider high density outcome, which connects the two. Now you might determine that, that that's way too much. Um, so all of, all of, the, all of this area in um, hatched orange is, is what we're calling the high density zone. And, and that's now a combination of precinct B, precinct A, and then some extra areas in between that connect it. So it, it's quite interesting when you think about the three, um, Paraparumu Beach, Raumati Town, and Paraparumu Town Centre, there's actually a triangle of land in there, which is quite, uh, has quite a lot of opportunity. Um, and um, it's quite challenging um, because I'm trying to apply some principles around this <laughs> in a consistent way. Um, and, and you come to these sorts of situations, you're like, which way should it go? Um, and uh, I think from a, from a, a future pers perspective, why not? And um, we don't know what's gonna happen in the metropolitan centre there, but if it gets developed well, and there's good connections under the motorway at the stream, which there can be, um, why not? But the level of development or redevelopment in those um, area A's, which are right next to the motorway, are probably quite low for some time, given the more recent development in there. And that's, that's it's just a, a cost of you know, demolishing and, and, and rebuilding. Um, so look, the, the, and the other aspect is um, Kapiti Road corridor is actually a corridor, you know, if you think about that as a whole centre rather than an individual centres, how do they all work together? Um, obviously, the attraction is at the at the beach. Um, there's a, there's obviously a high um, amenity at the beach. Um, there's already twelve storey building uh, there. Um, arguably, um, good or you know, there's not some some issues with it. But um, what does Carpety Road um, become in the future? And and remember that we're we're talking also about a light industrial mixed use area through there. Lots of employment opportunities. We've got um, the the airport and the redevelopment opportunities in the airport. And so there's actually quite a big big picture discussion to have around that. Um, and if Kapiti Road becomes quite a corridor of movement, you know, why not develop near the beach with a good bus transport system that takes them to the train station to go into into Wellington or elsewhere? Um, so that was one uh, area. Um, I I thought the um, uh, there's a bit of a lost opportunity around the rail station at Paraparu Umu. Um, it's zoned uh, sort of light industrial with or general industrial with a 10 meter overlay, 10 meter height. So um, uh, I, th I think going forward, there's probably an opportunity to reconsider that. Um, I think it's out of scope, but um, I just wanted to raise that as um, it's right next to the rail. Um, what do you do with that land? 
um, given that we're looking at intensifying residential around it as well. Um, um, absolutely. Mm. And look, I, and I'm pleased you raise that because I think in Wellington in general, there's a really good mix of that. You don't have to drive across town to go and, and work in a place like that. Um, and, and I think we sometimes forget that the centre is the centre and, and all this other stuff happens, but you've still got to get there. And the same at, 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 um, at um, um, uh, Porirua, for example, you know, there's actually some really good industrial type activities right near the centre, right near residential. And so you can actually walk to those things. It's not, it's not that far away. Um, so it's not just about the centre as a retail centre, it's, it's the collective of where people are going to work in the future. And I think Wellington does it really well. You know, there's, and you look at Lower Hutt, for example, there's, there's a good mix of, of um, industrial areas in around the, the residential and it provides for that opportunity. So, uh, no, it should be, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why it's hard for that place to really hum. Correct. Mm. Yeah. And it, it in the, the, the railway, the motorway, the topography, it all contributes to all of that. <laughs> Quite, you know, we've been asked, well, what about the tsunami risk in, in Pyro <laughs> or the or the you know the the fault line that runs right through, you know, um um to Tahiti to Tahiti Bay Road where you know basically that's where it is. And you're like, well. If you, again, if you're going to allow three stories, should you allow them more, or how do you how do you deal with that? Um, particularly if you're dealing with you know base isolation stuff and the cost of that. Um, so look, I don't necessarily want to take you through all of these. I suppose the only, only um, and, and happy to answer some questions on that. But um, the other probably the other point is is the additional hike around the centre at, at Paraparaumu. Um and and I just I put in my evidence that. Um, there's kind of a bit of an issue around um, the mixed use zone on the flanks of that um, and what that zone actually achieves uh, in terms of height. Uh, and, and I kind of tried to illustrate that on the first page of, of attachment C, um, which it's actually quite flat. <laughs> I was hoping the, um, I was hoping the, 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 the difference in height was going to be a bit more um, dramatic on a draw on a diagram, but um, what, what we've done there is the, is, so this is attachment C, first page, my evidence. Um, so the, the plan at the top is, um, is showing where the section is with a dashed black line running through it. Uh, so it's effectively uh, roughly parallel to the railway, just, just, just between that and, and Rimu Road. Um, and so the first um, illustration is the proposed district plan heights. So, and, and this is looking at big blocks. It's not looking at individual properties. So it's a big block. Um, uh, the, the, the 40 meters in the, in the metropolitan center in the middle, uh, stepping down to 21 meters in the mixed juice zone in the, in the pink, and then further down to 20 meters in the high density zone um, uh, uh, around that. Uh, and I'll, oh, sorry, I've used, I've used that terminology, but it probably should be the precinct A. Uh, versus um, Kaiungora's submission was uh, 53 metres in the in the centre, uh, 36 uh, in a in a 400 metre um, catchment around it, um, but it, it didn't actually seek to change the the mixed juice height, um, so that stayed at 20 21 in that middle example, and so there's an invert there which is a bit a bit odd. Um, the the reality reality is that you're not going to get all of this happening anyway, so there's going to be a whole mix of heights um, through that, uh, and 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 buildings which will create spaces in these blocks. Um, but if there is the opportunity, uh, and I've just put that in um, figure three, is the potential for, for the mixed use zone to also be increased to 36 meters um, to provide um, a similar height as to the residential opportunity around it. Um, now, all of them enable residential in them, um, whether we need all these different zones, I'm not entirely sure, but. Um, uh, the, 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 the idea again is to um, provide a, an expectation of height through a standard that, um, that a developer in Saikau will on you know, 
quite likely going to get to sort of that number. Uh, but I know I'm going to have to go through a design exercise to ensure the outcome is appropriate. Um, and it's at the right place, it's sort of next to the train station that's going to add development to and residential opportunity around the centre as well as hopefully in the centre. Um, if we can convince some of our other commercial players to actually add residential into the centres as well. So, um, uh, and then and then I was going to go to the design guides from there. Um, <laughs> and I've, I've I haven't spent a huge amount of time critiquing that. I think we need to get to the point of, well, what's the what's the planned outcome that we want? How do we achieve it? Make sure the standards are right. And then what's the guidance in there? Um, and interestingly, there's some really good diagrams in there that actually illustrate, um, as I think I said before, some uh, more dense outcomes, which are not necessarily constrained by height in relation to boundary. Um, and what's quite important, I think, going forward is um, how, how does somebody assess a building that is perhaps at the height limit, over the height limit, over the height in relation to boundary? What are the issues that need to be discussed around there? What's the expectation of sunlight, dominant shading? And some guidance on that is really important in this environment in an urban residential sense versus a more suburban outcome. Um, Kaimura has suggested or asked that they be non-statutory. What's your view on that? Why? Uh, look, I, I, I think they can be both. Um, and the, the criti critical aspect um, that I've come to the conclusion on is that the policy direction needs to in terms of outcome. Because as an urban designer, I like to wander and find other options and other, other assessment criteria that actually, you know, helps to uh, articulate an outcome that's relative to a policy. So I, I, I see the, the, the design guides are really important uh, in an assessment. Um, some of them are, are much better than others, and some of them I'm recommending that they shouldn't be in because they just aren't fit for purpose. I think these are, you know, a really good good start on, on, on that. Um, so as long as you've got a, a policy direction uh, and the way that the, the plans work in, in the Wellington context is you, you kind of, and, and now in Auckland actually, the, it goes back to the policy. So if you're assessing it, it goes back to the policy. What are you trying to achieve? Do you achieve it? Um, here's some examples of how you achieve that um, and, and what you shouldn't be doing. And so kind of partly the, the issue about what you shouldn't be doing is probably as good as what you should be doing. I think why they're being successful in Wellington is because they are statutory. Yes, yep. In Auckland, they um, they're not statutory. They're, it's a it's a um, <laughs> the Auckland design manual that sits outside the plan, um, but it's definitely used in terms of assessments. Um, and it depends on where your teeth is, right? So if you've got teeth in your policy, you need to explain how you achieve that. If, if the policy is too weak, then you then you've got to rely on that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think that's all I. I wanted to say really yeah. um and look just in terms of sorry just one other thing in terms of that um these maps um we haven't gone to every place it's 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 a big task right and um but uh what we have used is street view on google quite a lot and um i have been to a lot of these places but i haven't been to individual sites and so where there's an issue that we identify at a boundary or a, so we actually used Google Street View and Google Maps and the 3D, 3D um, digital terrain, which has actually been really useful in that regard. Um, so it, it's it's a big, big job. It's not necessarily 100% right. I'm not saying that. Um, uh, uh, and and, um, and maybe in Otaki, where, you know, in terms of the, the response here, uh, um, the, the question about height and form and all of that, I think that's a, it, it's a, it's a big challenge. Um, I'm coming from a, an urban design perspective on what's the opportunity in Otaki. So going back to the San Gimignano option, what, what do we do? Uh, but I've also looked at the topography, the, the landform, and actually pulled some of that um, density back from uh, you know some of the 
the areas beyond the stream and up onto the higher lands um, to the north that it makes sense from a landscape perspective. So uh, that's the kind of strategy we've been using around <laughs> around all of this um, to try and. Um, but just going back to your early your early comments, I was interested in you know planning for growth and thirty year time frame, and I was thinking you know these these are huge changes re regardless of your submission or not. These are big changes in centres. Should it be? Um, sounds like I'd wonder if it should be more incremental. Um, you know that that what's the life of a district plan? What's the future of local government? These are existential <laughs> questions. <laughs> you don't have to answer them. So, um, you know, I mean, is it, you know, do some, um, go with what we have to do, go with what needs to be done, um, exercise what we have to do under the um, NPSUD, NBRS, well, and then, um, you know, see how that, Pans out in the next what we're talking ten years before maybe the next plan. What, what what's your view on that? Look, I share your sentiment, and, and it's um, it is tricky. Um, I put the question back: if you're going to develop a site now, should that be in a way that will last for fifty, hundred years at the right scale, versus doing it in ten years' time? Because that's that's the kind of decision. Right now, it wouldn't be in scale. Well, well, these things are going to be very out of scale. Co correct. Yes, and and I think you need to make um, uh, it clear that that is the expectation. We are changing this, and there will be adverse effects that are. And, and the NPS actually refer to that. Um, so, should you do? Yeah, it, it's 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 tricky. And 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 look, I it, it, in terms of the design guide, I, I made the note there that how do you how do you design a building that's six stories in the context of one story? Because the, the planning framework is as important as the, as the physical context, particularly going forward because it's a planned outcome, not just fitting within the existing environment. Because it's, so, it's massive change. But and it's I yeah. happening already yeah. you know, in areas that you can't assess anymore against the character of the area because it doesn't have any, it's about the future character of the area. Have a couple of questions, but the first is: Can you just? I didn't quite follow that thing about Raumati, so could you just explain that again? Um, okay, so I've got it on Google uh, Earth here, mm. so I'm orientated a little bit because your maps. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't show the big picture. No, it's, it's which was uh, making, uh, making it difficult for me. But um, got your got your big one, but so. We've got the train station, we've got the Metropolitan Centre, we've got Kapiti Road and the airport. Yeah. And then we've got Paraparuma Beach. And then just to the south, we've got Raumati Beach. Mm -hmm. And each of those two beach environments have a town centre, small town centre outcome. Yeah. Obviously, the, the northern one's bigger than the southern. Yeah. And because of the way the policy direction is around a walkable catchment from the metropolitan centre, so we start at Paraparaumu. Yeah. Um, that means that, and what council's quite rightly done is, is, is said the walkable catchment's actually um, beyond the motorway and it's on the western side and it goes up to, in this case, the edge of the um, airport. Yeah. And so on my maps, there's that shown with a, a purple um, outline. Yeah. Okay. So that's expecting, um, and I'll just say high density outcome. It's it's um, um, precinct A. Mm -hmm. right? Then you think about the centres, and so if we talk about Raumati first, um, Raumati the council said let's put four stories around Raumati. Mm -hmm. um, and that's illustrated in the pink by the pink line on my map. So again, um, when I looked at that, it was why would you put high density next to a fairly big barrier of the motorway with one connection under it to the centre, where it's actually probably more related to Raumati Beach Centre. So if, 
if you if, if I can point here, sir, um, this area in here, yeah, is more related to that centre than it is to the right. Um, and look, that might change. And I was I was a little confused around what opportunities are in the metropolitan centre. There's um, some plans that I've seen around dune protection, stormwater management, etc. Um, and so that's why I said before the metropolitan centre could actually develop quite well and could provide the connections under the motorway oh, to support that. Yeah. Right. But at the moment. But at the moment, it's hard to see that. Um, and and if I'm taking a a, a, a forward-looking approach, I would say zone it for more because that's the zone and, and there's, there's good development opportunities on Greenfield site right there. So hopefully that can be realised. And um, our principles were to apply high density around the town centre zones. Um, and so effectively what this plan shows is a change from precinct B to high density. So going effectively four storeys to six storeys around that centre. And if you then look at both of them, there was some areas in between that were then medium density or, or general residential. And so um, when you looked at, at that as a collective area, you say, well, actually, it makes sense to zone the whole lot high density. And it's interesting, I was also thinking about how how to, because the policy direction is around, you know, a walkable catchment around a centre, most of these centres are actually at the beach and half of it's the sea. So, um, again, trying to promote um, people at these places it may be a little bit further than a walkable catchment, but that's what the policy enables to happen as well. Right. So, so different from the council's position, you've increased the high density area around Raumati, but reduced the extent of precinct A in other parts. Is that how it works? Or uh, so at at the moment, this plan yeah um, keeps precinct A and yeah. turns it to high density yeah. It increases um, precinct B from four storeys to six. Yeah. So it's then high density, same zone. And then it has added some high density areas in between those two previous precincts. Right. So the whole lot becomes high density zone. There's no precincts applying. Yeah. Um, keep it simple. The alternative, and which I'll put in, in the evidence as well, is that you don't go that way. And you say the, the motorway is actually the barrier. Um, and we don't need that much development around it. And that alternative would look like the residential zone with only like variation control or something. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Right. And that would well, probably re remove the precinct A off that area. Right. So that would make. Um, I'm just, uh, I need to go and look at the site again, but uh, I'm struggling to understand how I, which way we should jump on that. <laughs> um, can, I, can I add another comment to, <laughs> to that? Um, and, and, and the other aspect of that, I'll just try and find the drawing for you, is um, there's sheet five of my maps. Hmm. Um, have we got that there? Yeah. So this is, yeah, this is effectively showing more of the metropolitan centre um, and the, and the industri like general industrial um, along Kapiti Road. Mm -hmm. The grey is the airport. Um, and if you look at, um, well, again, it's probably easy to point, um, this area in here, um, you can, you can appreciate that that's a, a relatively small um, suburban residential outcome currently. With a Sorry, where are you pointing? To, to this yeah. area here. Um, with a number of different colours on it um, and, um, and kind of spot zoning. But it's also connected to the general industrial of, of Kapiti Road. So while it doesn't necessarily follow the 
the policy precinct, you know, direction of walkable catchments of the centre, going back to my comments around what does the general industrial zone do in terms of residential um, intensification around it, there is a relationship there. Um, and some of, you know, I, I know there's there's office buildings within that in that um, environment as well. So uh, it, it's actually quite tricky. Um, and and uh, again, I would say um, if you're going to zone um, that, it's not necessarily um, consistent with all the policies and the principles, but it makes sense in terms of the um, um, employment op opportunities and what Carpety Road might be might be doing in the future, or well, and now for, for that matter, which is you know, quite intensive. Yeah. So look, it, it's a it's quite a problem area actually, um, mm. and it, and I think it also relates to what happens with the airport going forward. Um, but like I say, there's there's not a lot of development opportunity I can see in that particular area, um, given the more recent um, uh, improvements in terms of built form on there. It's not that old. Um, be hard pressed to, to knock them down and start again. Do you mean in that area, um, which is showing so us? Yeah, yeah, that's quite. That's probably nineteen eighties, is it? Nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. Hmm. That is an interesting thought, though, um, because it's both a problematic area but an area of some opportunity. That's right. So, so that that's why I've I've kept it on the map for now, um, but highlighting that issue through the evidence mm. for consideration. Just returning to, to Ōtaki, it's a, it sort of is in a tier one territory, but it's at, at the end of a territory and it has its own sort of history. Um, I'm struggling with it because um, we're probably going to hear tomorrow about their aspirations for identity. And it seems to me that at one level you could say, well, um, form and function don't really change cultural identity but actually a lot of these debates are, are actually around identity i mean even pakia we've all got culture i accept that point <laughs> we'll we'll say that's not who we are at that sort of level of height uh, and that's what i think tangata whenua have said in their submission and um I, I accept everything that Mr. Singh says about that, but the reality is that, that we are confronting, in this case, a community that has a strong cultural identity saying these heights do not resonate with us and our identity. And, and um, um, there is a special way in which we need to privilege identity in that way. Um, and I'm just wondering, can you help us with that? Like, I mean, how how do you, as an urban designer, respond or urban form respond to the particular challenge that you've got a community that actually used to be in Horofenua? <laughs> it's had a boundary adjustment that's brought it into the Wellington region, but in historical circumstances, it has not been part of a conurbation. It is at the end of the, the railway line. <laughs> Uh, with its own village cultural identity, there's an expression of who they are. And um, so there's some accidental features as to why they're even being considered in this context. Um, and um, there is a specific direction in Kaingaora to, to consider those things. And I'm, we're not trying to make it difficult. We're trying to get you a help because you've got a specific statutory mandate to look at those things. Do you have any comment well, look, on I, that? I, I would love to hear the evidence tomorrow. Um, I'm unfortunately in another hearing tomorrow. <laughs> um, and, and that conversation is, is vital yeah. and really important. Um, look, there is other places like Cambridge and Waipar and places that are also in, in the same kind of realm. Um, it's not, not the only place. Um, and... <laughs> And I think it's it's important just to think about because I think it goes not just Maori but 
everybody else as well. I mean, if you talk to most Kiwis, right, quarter acre backyards out in dead today. Yeah. Right. So we're all being challenged on this. Mm. Um, and if it's okay to put three stories here, does that challenge the identity or not? What does four do? What does five? What does six? And I don't know the answer to that. Mm. What I'm saying is there is an opportunity here to zone for intensification around the center. Mm. Uh, and, and, and the feedback you'll get hopefully tomorrow will, you know, will tease out some of those cultural identities, which are really important here. Um, there is a precinct that's applying around the Marae. Um, and, and once we found out, you know, the implications of that, we, we pulled back um, center expansion, for example. Um, uh, but I have suggested that, you know, the density might go to, to, to the domain. So you've actually got a connection between the center and the open space, the domain, um, and, and a logical boundary there. Now, if the height needs to be managed, because you could still zone at high density, you could still have an overlay that reduces height, because it's not necessarily about density, it's about height, and that's in building form, right? And so does it matter whether there's two, three, five families living on that site or, or one? What does that do in terms of identity and, and cultural response? Mm. Um, because, and that's that's what we're kind of dealing with across the, the regions at, at the moment. Um, you know, there's a big discussion on height because it's high density, but actually, you know, in the character areas of Wellington, we're talking about, you know, zoning at high density, but you might actually limit that because of particular character outcomes. And that's not to say that you can't have high density and there's actually five dwellings in a, in a, in a historic building on, you know, in, on mm. Mount Dick, for example. So it's not necessarily the density it's the building form that might be of more concern, right? So you can you can you can say, well, um, actually, from a policy perspective, let's let's encourage density around it. That's a good thing. Now, what's the height or what's yeah. the bulk, and you know all of that, and you can apply whatever you like through a precinct in terms of relationships to to others and how that should manifest. Yeah. So, yeah. Look, I'm I'm I'd be really keen to hear more on that well i will extend an invitation to you and kai Gore's team to listen on youtube uh the yeah, presentation yeah, and i'll yeah. extend to you the privilege of responding if you have any particular ideas that you want thank you yeah. um in relation to that because i think it isn't quite important because they're probably managing this tension as well because what mr cullen's evidence tells us and others is, is that down the turnpike, the Mokapuna are going to have to be housed uh, and there have to be opportunities for that. Um, but there may be solutions around density that don't solve height. And ultimately, um, uh, I don't personally want to feel like I'm imposing any controls on that, but um, um, it's a way of walking together that I think is particularly important in this locality. Um, so that I, I will extend that invitation to you. Um, the other observation I'd make is that it, it does seem to me that you're, um, before I go to another point, that you have actually done quite a, even though you've been limited to time, quite a finely grained uh, spatial assessment um, in the time limited. So I commend you on that. When I made the point about template, it was a little bit around the functional extending it to Otaki because it's town centre without the time. Yep. And I appreciate that there are pluses and minuses mm -hmm. to that. But um, coming back to this point that you always emphasise about ultimately these broader controls won't achieve good design. Um, it, uh, uh, by inclination, I'm attracted to more freedom than less. Um, but Freedom needs to be exercised responsibly, and and is the is that tension resolved by a relatively liberal regime, but good discretions, or is it um, like how do you how do you reconcile those tensions in your mind? Look, I, I tend to agree with what you just said. Um, more liberal than not. Um, we, if you remember, the submission actually had um, a permitted activity for six units yeah. in high density. I said that's, you know, I don't actually necessarily agree with three on the site as <laughs> a permitted activity. And so what we're trying to do is say, here's the framework for you to build a building. 
but we've got some specific outcomes that are really important in terms of how that building relates to the public realm. And we require a consent and an assessment process through that. So it, it is quite open around the, the but but guided by the policy direction around that. Okay. So um yeah, just just I mean the MDRS is an example where it doesn't necessarily create good good design outcomes. It's just it sets a framework for that. Um so for example, um twenty percent of windows to a street, yeah, um, they can be to a garage. There's actually no requirement for that to actually properly interface with the street. And I've had exactly that argument with a client. I said, you can't put a garage horizontal to the, you know, parallel to the street mm. and put some windows up there and call that 20%. It's not achieving your policy direction. So, um, and then it comes down to guidance from council and, and experts and, and who's employed to do that um, to assist with um, uh, assessment of those as to good urban design outcomes. So you would say that the 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 battles that rage around height are a distraction because it's really about the design. Yeah, that's right. And and there might be many sites where you're never going to get to six stories because the, the the height and relation to boundary controls you down below that. Mm. You still got to design a good building. Um, you might project through the height and relation to boundary in a in a place because it's next to a commercial centre with a you know tire fitting factory or something next door to it and then a, a vertical boundary is, is appropriate but it, it, it enables um the the, the the trigger for assessment enables that to to be then assessed and that's why i say the, the design guide then needs to have some guidance as to what are the the matters around that that, that, right. that help it okay so that's useful thank you I suppose we're um, back to the planner, are we? Uh, thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was very uh, interesting evidence. Thank you. I'm amazed you haven't got glasses after looking at Google Earth across most of New Zealand. <laughs> right. So um, I have two questions, um, and there'll be others. Um, the first question is a, um, a somewhat um, minor point, but there was a criticism of the use of the concept of a precinct as an overlay for a qualifying matter. So um, I think Mr. Singh said, well, if it's a, it should technically be an, an overlay, it shouldn't be a precinct. And my question is, do, does that really matter? And what's the difference? So that's in regard to the coastal yeah. qualifying matter. Um, so my view is that ideally, uh, where you're looking to manage an issue, you, sh you should it should be through a through an overlay, but that would require rules and a framework around that as well. In this case, um, the the use of a precinct in this case I think is is appropriate. It's a holding it's a holding pattern basically until a future plan change comes through. Yeah. Um, it's just basically holding existing development to the existing operative plan rule yeah. framework. There are no coastal rules, I guess, around you know. There's no no hazard management rule framework well actually worse that. than that um it's a bit of a hot topic and uh, the council would prefer to signal it as holding rather than something they've specifically decided to manage so um your answer is precinct is fine given its function and and nature as, as a holding pattern until there is a proper rule framework that supports exactly the issue that it's managing so effectively um my my second question is, given the exchange that we had with Mr. Ray, walk us through the, just can you just walk us through the regime as to how it manages design and all that sort of thing so that it, I understand that. And I apologize. It's just been 
so many different things I keep on forgetting yeah. where I am. No, that that's um, understandable. There's a lot to take in across um, across a day, and of course across the whole hearing. So, the um, the plan as proposed, the, the plan change as proposed, do, doesn't really have any specific policy framework around design outcomes that effectively defers to the design guide mm -hmm. within assessment criteria. So, what I'm recommending is that there actually be quite a clear policy framework that articulates the design outcomes that, that you're expecting to see. So for example, um, in the high density chapter, mm -hmm. and, and the same policy is also within the amended um, appendix A, so it would apply in the general residential chapter for multi-unit developments as well. But there's a new policy recommended that basically sets out what we consider to be the key urban design outcomes that every development of more than three developments, uh, three units rather, should should be providing for. Um, so it goes through the actual built form uh, situation and it relates back to the planned urban built character of the zone. So it's not based on existing um, uh, HRZ P's, uh, PX6. Sorry, did I say P10? Sorry. HRZ PX6, page four. So it basically steps through um, these nine key design objectives that we've, or outcomes that we've, we've worked through there. And this has been informed through um, advice from Mr. Ray, but effectively um, how the building sits within its context and, and um, presents to the public realm and then it goes through and, and then looks at how internal amenity also needs to be provided. So it's, it's, it's breaking it down in a policy framework being quite directive while still at a high level about the key things that need to be achieved to, a, to get a good urban design outcome and a, a good well-functioning urban environment. At the moment the, the plan change doesn't have this particular policy framework, it doesn't provide this direction at this level. Um, so in my opinion, it, it's, it strengthens um, the need for good design outcomes. I, um, I absolutely agree that design guides are a really useful tool. Um, and, and in my opinion, they work in companion with this policy framework, but I don't consider that they need to be part of the plan. You know, they're full of um, really great assessment criteria but if you if you work to the key outcomes that we've articulated directly within this policy framework, the design guides are a really fundamental and useful tool to help you understand how you can achieve these these outcomes. So, so it's educational rather than uh, it, exactly a it provides making criteria. It, it provides yeah examples of of the best ways to achieve that. So it's it's exactly guidance as it says it is. But Mr. Ray said he was agnostic about that. Um, that the key feature seemed to be whether the teeth lay in the discretion. So that's the corollary to his point. Yeah, I think, correct. I think Mr. Ray was was basically his, I don't want to speak on his behalf, but but my interpretation was that so long as there's clear policy direction around those key design outcomes, um, he was fairly agnostic as to whether or not the design guides are in or out of the plan. Okay. So that's useful. But that there should be specificity within the plan at, at, at this scale. And those are quite demanding policies, right? So the way it's expressed um, is saying we provide for it where it can be demonstrated. Yeah. So there is a a sense in which the burden falls on the applicant to do that. Yeah, and that's in recognition that these these areas are going to transition into a, a you know a much more urban form, and um, it's certainly not my view that design outcomes should be you know left in the ether. I think it's it, it's intentional that that design outcomes are very clearly for, at the forefront. Right. So, just to get that clear in my head. Because I talked about this idea of short-term paying for long-term gain, um, 
you acknowledge that some of the density of the, the, the controls, the site controls and so forth will lead to short-term pain, but this is to secure the long-term gain. In other words, that what long-term is obtained is actually high quality. Is that a way of thinking about it that makes sense? Yeah, I think I think that captures it. Um, that that is the reality, you know. the 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 direction is that there um, there are areas in tier one um, districts where greater intensity is is to be um, specifically enabled, mm -hmm. and as a result, you're going to get you know you're going to get at some point that transition and that short term pain sort of effect. Um, the key is to make sure that that's well designed within its context. Would you make the criticism, leaving aside the height allowance that the council's made, that it lacks policy content in terms of those long-term design outcomes? Yeah, my, I guess my view is that um, the policy that I'm recommending is is filling a gap, hmm. effectively. So there is a gap to be filled? In my opinion, yes. Yeah. Uh, in my Yeah, in my opinion, this is strengthening what yeah. what is currently within the provisions. Yeah. Okay. So then passing down to the cap rules to show how that operates just yeah. can get really <laughs> mechanical. <laughs> so once um once you're in the realm of more than three units on a on a site, so the trigger point is um as, as it is in the MGRS, uh, so you can do up to three units as a permitted activity, otherwise you require consent under rule. Um, in, in the high density chapter, it's HRZRX6. And again, this is just carrying across the format from the, the plan change. So there's not, not too much different in terms of the rule framework particularly, except we have, in the matters of discretion, um, provided a little bit greater clarity within there as well to strengthen that. So what number is this? HRZR6 on page 14. It may actually be useful to because everything's in blue text, because it's a new zone, it might actually be useful to instead look at the general residential zone version, which can actually, it's a lot easier to see the changes I've made as opposed to it all being blue text. So if you go to page 16 of my appendix A, and you go to GRZ, Rx six. Of the of appendix A. Sorry. B. Uh, it's GRZRX6 on page 16, the bottom book. Yep. Yep. So um, as proposed, the, the key matter of discretion was just basically matters contained in the design guide. Whereas following through from the policy that I've provided, I've, I've outlined in greater specificity. The, um, I guess, the key areas of interest for the matters of discretion from a design perspective. So it just steps through. I, I can talk you through it, but it's probably. Well, um... Yeah. So again, uh, sorry. that's all right. So it's a, the, the plan in the plan the design guide's doing the heavy work it's even defining the matters of discretion and everything it's just whereas this is a more 
conventional structured approach yeah so the i guess the the approach i'm recommending it, it's quite explicit what it is you're looking at yeah what the key things are that you need to be considering um the first point at, i guess at my number two um it's how it sits within its its context and its environment and, and then it goes through at point three greater specificity around the actual on-site amenity outcomes that you're looking to achieve so rather than just referring to a design guide which has dozens of criteria and guidance within it it's setting out what those key key aspects are yes these have been developed in in, in a conversation with mr ray Long the, the design guides not being statutory is sometimes you know they they're quite useful for people in terms of illustrations is it why do why don't you want them statutory i think i i absolutely agree that they're they're really useful and my my expectation is that they would be available and, and you know certainly um used alongside the issue is when you have design guides as well as this level of specificity that I'm recommending is, is more clear and more direct at the policy and matters of discretion position mm -hmm. is you then end up often with matters um, areas of conflict or inconsistency between the two um, and and so it's a lot clearer that if, if you've got these issues or these matters more clearly articulated within the plan provisions the guide is really that it's guidance as to how how you achieve that mm -hmm. so um so i'm absolutely supportive of design guides you know i think they absolutely um are essential uh, to the to the wider community to understand actually what those what what good design actually looks like you know from the images and, and such like um but i think it's really important to have it more clearly articulated within the plan um we get one um so it's, this is a um question about the ub um the ntsud so in policy three and this is about the not the um city center zones but um d says within the adjacent to neighborhood center zones local center zones town center zones building heights and densities urban form commensurate with the level of commercial activity and community services now this has come up for us during the hearing do you I'm just thinking about the word commensurate because a lot of the um, centres in um, Kapiti are particularly small and wouldn't necessarily um, serve the local community. The Jolly Pub might serve some people um, and then there's other ones that are quite small. Do you, do you think the discretion is there for the council if they look at um, a, a centre and say, well, it, it isn't suitable for any walkable catchment? of in intensification is that is that a is it that open is that your interpretation yes i i i can sit yeah I, I do think there is that opportunity um and certainly i know in the submission from kainga aura was seeking um much greater intensification around those smaller centers for example which we haven't carried through in evidence because our view is that those, some of those centers are, mm. are, are very small um so yes i think um the hierarchy of centres in, in Kapiti is somewhat ambitious, I think, compared to, you know, the scale and nature of, of, of what's been offered within those centres. Mm. Um, so you could say that, so the council could say, well, we don't think around the Jolly Pub or any of those ones, actually, that it is appropriate to provide any walkable catchment for the sick and serve doesn't serve that population yeah well the yeah certainly my interpretation yeah. of the of the guidance is that it's commensurate to to that yes yeah. that level of activity cool thank you no I, I think that's very helpful um it's given us some food for thought 
the problem is that I'm going to go through this <laughs> and suddenly think I've got a question. So um, one of our strategies is to not close the hearing completely and leave our option to come back and ask questions if we need to. Um, but Ms. Corbell, did you want to take over and sort of identify what you need to do and what we've missed? Yes, thank you. Um, really just um, a couple of comments and then a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, I suppose if there was one section in my written submissions that I'd, I'd like you to look back at when you have an opportunity is section four, um, and in particular the paragraphs which give you a bit of context for the promulgation of the NPCUD and the Amendment Act, which is the Productivity Commission's report in 2016, uh, using land for housing. And there were some key findings in there which um, were, were very well captured by Mr Singh when he gave evidence saying, look, you know, we have a statutory duty to deliver housing. Um, and there are some districts where we find it very challenging because of the planning framework. Um, so I think it is imp important to bear that context in mind. Um, and then I go on to say, actually, uh, policy three of the NPSUD is very directive. There isn't a lot of discretion that councils have. Um, now, um, Commissioner Black's raised the issue, well, surely there's some discretion when considering what's commensurate uh, with levels of commercial activity and community services. And I think Ms. Williams was right to say, yes, there is an aspect of that. However, if you were to ask that question of Mr. Cullen, he would say, well, yes, but actually you can use density as a mechanism for stimulating um, more flourishing, thriving centres. So, you know, if you have some centres that are not um, living up to their expectations or not performing the role that they should be performing in the hierarchy, then, you know, targeted density is one way to actually encourage them to take up that role in a more, in an appropriate way. Have I got that right, Mike? Thank you. <laughs> um, so that's just one thing I wanted to say about that. Um, the other thing is that, um, Although the policy three of the MPSUD with its stepped levels of enabling, enablement um, is very directive, the, the, the legislation is also very directive about um, the circumstances in which you can reduce the level of enablement that you can provide. And that's where the qualifying matters come into play. And as I said earlier, we haven't had to traverse a lot of that in this hearing, but um, the legislation's very clear and very um, detailed about what you have to do in order to provide an evidential basis for a qualifying matter. Uh, and one of the things that's occurred to me this afternoon, just getting to your issue, Commissioner, about whether we should be taking a more incremental approach is that while you uh, you don't have a lot of room to move in terms of what you've been directed to do right now, you do have the ability on my reading of the Amendment Act to revisit the issue of qualifying matters in future. You just can't use an intensification plan, pro plan change process to do so. But you could promulgate future qualifying matters by a, a standard Schedule 1 plan change process if you felt that that might be necessary to pull back in some areas, say in a few years from now, where um, you know, with the passage of time, you found that the degree of enablement you had to give effect to wasn't quite right in some places. Uh, and that, for example, could be a solution for the otaki type situation where, you know, on the face of it, you might say, well, if the, if, if the, um, if the tongue defender and cultural associations that make otaki special, um, you know, if council had really thought about it, it could have promulgated a qualifying matter to do with those things, for example. Well, um, you know, we have this, um, we have this, you know, council publication, you know, to Tupu Pai growing well. I mean, the, the council has clearly signaled that it wants otaki to be, um, you know, a, 
to take on greater prominence as a district centre um, for the northern half of the district. So it's quite clearly put a stake in the ground and said, we want Otaki to grow and thrive and, and, and flourish uh, while respecting its cultural identity. So council's well aware of where it wants to get to in terms of an outcome, I think, for Otaki. Uh, and I would suggest that one way it could do that would be to look carefully at a, a qualifying matter and how that might work, having regard to some of those considerations. And it might be that they haven't had time to do that yet, but it could be something they look at in future. And as I say, I don't think the legis I think the legislation doesn't foreclose the use of qualifying matters in future. But interested to know what the council thinks about that. Um, I think really those were the key points I wanted to make. Um, there were a couple of housekeeping things. Um, firstly, uh, Ms. Williams uh, has indicated that there are a couple of errors in some of the provisions. So I would like the opportunity to provide a final, definitive, accurate set of those provisions if that's acceptable. And we could do that quite quickly. Uh, the second thing is that you've um, kindly offered uh, Kainga Ora an opportunity to, um, to listen to and then, if necessary, respond to um, what you'll be hearing tomorrow. Um, and I'm quite keen to understand how you might like us to do that in the time frame within which we could do that. Is my um, so um, we're on YouTube and um, I'm respectful of the fact that you've all got commitments. Um, uh, so it, it, it could be that you would respond in writing after Easter, um, because um, our framing up of where we're going can incur in tandem to these issues being picked up. So um, I'd rather give you more time, but I'll issue a minute and just say when you can do that, but, but that's an indication. Um, but I would like, uh, but given your statutory mandate, I would like as much assistance as I could with the Otaki, and I've explained to Mr. Ray why it's historical background. Um, we haven't closed our idea, our mind to the idea that we would establish our own qualifying matter. Um, we're respectful that we need to hear Nga Apuo Otaki, and they might convince us that there is a need for it to be expressed in a in particular way, so we, we're not closed-minded about that, but that was an interesting thought. Um, so that's that's how we wanted to track. Um, but I did have one housekeeping matter that arose out of uh, today. Um, I do want to seriously consider uh, Ms. Williams' regime, but these processes, while designed to get an optimal solution, uh, have aspects that make that difficult, and I'll explain why. Um, Mr. Banks has a position, which he said in opening, he's still open to listen to other people's views, so he's retained an open mind. But we run the risk that Ms. Williams gives us her version and he doesn't tell us, well, if you adopt that version, these are the things that I need to, I think you should add to. Um, and I think that's a poor use of the resources. So for myself, I want to seriously consider this option. Um, and so there may be sub processes where we allow uh, Ms. Ms. Williams and Mr. Banks to confer uh, on particular points. And that, and, and, I mean, there's the lazy option, which is that we just fall between two stools and say, well, these are two options and, and this isn't perfect, so we'll go with that. That's not the way I do business, which is to get to the best possible outcome. So there'll be funny things happening along the way uh, to make sure that we've got the, in the what I call the dialectic of a hearing, point and counterpoint, the best of both sides of that argument. Um, and I suppose that means there could be some other sub processes here some form of expert conferencing perhaps well it could be it could look like that um uh, but for example the bifurcation of the, the creating that high density zone i think is a very good signal for people about where an area 
is suitable. It's a good signal. Um, uh, I, I'm quite attracted to the policy framework that gives direction around that. Um, so there's there's a mix here of things that I, I'd like to reflect on with our team and then come back to you, but I'm just signaling that it could be that or it could be giving Mr. Banks a chance to respond and then Ms. Williams to respond to that. And it's a bit messy, but it, it just, you understand my purpose is to get to the best um, outcome. Yep, that's that's understood and that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and even if you wanted to issue a minute specifically posing some questions that you'd like written answers to, that would work also. Yeah, so we'll hear from orally from Mr. Banks uh, on Tuesday or some other thing, and then he's going to come back and do it in writing. And I expect that that will then engender us questions. And it may be that, that he says, uh, in principle, I agree with Ms. Williams, but I'd like more time to confirm it. I mean, who knows? There's so many potential outcomes that could arise. Thanks. So just so people understand the complexity of what we're dealing with. That's fine. Thank you. Um, can I just, on behalf of the Kaingora team, thank you for your attention today and also thank our hosts and the hospitality that you provided us today. We're very appreciative of that. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Do you want to close? No. Do you want to close with a quick me or Kaji or you're good? To end this off, um, in the way that we started, we said some guidance from up above. So let us pray. Amen.